Okay, we are live on YouTube. Good morning and welcome to the June 28th, 2022 public hearing and public meeting of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. We'll begin this morning by taking attendance and I will turn it over to our general counsel, Mark Silverman, to do that right now. Thank you, uh, Chair Carroll. Uh, Chair Carroll? Here. Commissioner Bland. Uh, Commissioner Shamir Barron? Here. Commissioner Chapin? Here. Commissioner Chen? Yeah. Commissioner Devonshire? Here. Commissioner Goldblum? Commissioner Gustafson? Here. Commissioner Jefferson? Yeah. Commissioner Lutfi? Who's that? Yes? I don't, I don't see her. I don't see her. Uh, Commissioner Holford Smith. All right, good morning again and welcome to our public hearing and public meeting of June 28th. We will uh, have a little bit of everything today. We have some public meeting items and some public hearing items. We will start the agenda with some public meeting items for our research department, which includes um, a presentation and a vote on two proposed historic districts, and then a presentation and a vote on whether or not to calendar another property. Um, then we will have a public meeting item for an application for work on a designated property. And then we will begin our public hearing agenda to review applications for new work on designated properties. And this meeting is being held via Zoom and it is live streamed on our YouTube channel. If you would like to participate in any of the public hearing items, you may do so by joining the meeting at the estimated time that is shown on our agenda, which can be found on our website. And if you would just like to watch the proceedings, you may do so by going to our YouTube channel. And with that, I will turn it over to our Director of Research, Kate Limos mikhail Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. Um, this morning, we will start with two items for the um, proposed for the public meeting agenda. Item one is LP 2655, the proposed Cambria Heights 222nd Street Historic District in Queens, with a proposed boundary as detailed in the agenda and described in this presentation. Item number two is LP 2656, the Cambria Heights 227th Street Historic District, also in Queens and with that boundary also in the agenda. Um, good morning, I'm Kate Lemus McHale, Director of Research. Um, and I'm very pleased to pre present these two proposed historic districts for a vote today. Um, these districts contain 96 row houses facing each other along two blocks in the Cambria Heights neighborhood of Southeastern Queens. Built in 1931, they comprised two remarkably cohesive and intact groups of storybook style row houses, which incorporate Tudor style elements. The districts were calendared on August 10th, 2021. And at the public hearing on September 14th, two people spoke in favor of designation of both districts, including representatives of council member Danique Miller and the New York Landmarks Conservancy. One resident of the proposed Cambria Heights 227th Street spoke in opposition to the proposed district. Two other people spoke neither in favor of nor in opposition to the proposed districts, but had some questions. The commission also received a written submission from the Four Borough Neighborhood Preservation Alliance in favor of both districts. Four written submissions from residents of the proposed um, Cambria Heights 222nd Street Historic District in favor of designation. And four written submissions from residents of the proposed Cambria Heights 227th Street District. Three were in favor and one was opposed. The proposed Cambria Heights 222nd Street Historic District contains 46 row houses between 115th Road and 116th Avenue. It was developed by a company called Selective Homes Incorporated and designed by the Queens architectural firm of Monda and Bertolazzi. Five blocks away, the proposed Cambria Heights 227th Street Historic District contains 50 houses between 116th Avenue and Linden Boulevard. It was developed by the Queens firm Wallaceoff Brothers as part of a planned development of 600 houses called St. Albans Lawns. These, um, this proposed historic district is the only part of St. Albans Lawns that ultimately was completed. 
These two blocks are identified as part of a survey undertaken by the research department beginning in 2019 to identify meritorious examples of Queens Row House developments built in the 1920s and 30s as residential development was spreading outward through the borough with the advent of the automobile. Both 222nd and 227th streets stood out in the survey as very distinctive, both in comparison to other examples of this type of row house development throughout Queens and within their neighborhood in general. The historic character of each block is largely intact with a clear and strong sense of place. Focusing on these streets in Cambria Heights fits within our equity framework as we seek to increase designations in communities not well represented by landmarks and to better tell the story of all New Yorkers. A predominantly African-American and Afro-Caribbean community, Cambria Heights has no designated landmarks and, was, and is within a large section of Eastern Queens with few landmarks or historic districts. Located in Southeastern Queens, the Cambria Heights neighborhood is on the border of Nassau County, generally between Murdoch Avenue on the north and the Montefiore Cemetery on the south. This 1918 map shows the area with a proposed street, street get grid that was later abandoned. The purple outlines show the approximate locations of the proposed historic districts near Linden Boulevard, which was then called Central Avenue. Into the 1890s, this was part of the old town of Jamaica. Located far from existing train lines between Queens Village to its north and the small village of Springfield to its south, this area remained rural well into the 20th century. Before it was known as Cambria Heights, it was typically described as being part of St. Albans or Springfield. Um, and I love this map in, in this aerial photo. In 1924, you can see that we're still farmland here. Um, there was little desire to develop an area so far removed from railroads and other mass transit at the time. Um, as this 1926 Sanborn map shows, the name Cambria Heights was in use by that time. The neighborhood's name appears rooted in the 1917 purchase by Pennsylvania's Cambria Title Savings and Trust Company of 80 acres of farmland east of Springfield Boulevard, south of the proposed historic districts. The blue outlines show the locations of the proposed districts in the heart of this new neighborhood. As infrastructure investment shifted away from railroads and streetcars towards highways and private vehicles by the late 1920s, Robert Moses's extensive Long Island Parkway network was taking shape including the Southern State Parkway leading eastward from Cambria Heights starting in 1927. By 1930, work had begun on the first vehicular bridge linking Queens to the mainland, the Triborough now um, RF Kennedy Bridge. In a new, and a new parkway network was underway in Queens, part of the proposed Metropolitan Loop, which is shown here on the right. Despite the depression, thousands of homes were under construction or nearing completion in Southeastern Queens at that time. There is a reason for this remarkable growth, one developer stated in 1930. It is simply an expression on the part of the people of New York City that they still love trees and lawns and sunshine. The architects of 222nd and 227th streets incorporated elements of the Tudor revival style with what has come to be known in recent years as the storybook style. Primarily associated with freestanding houses, the Tudor revival was adapted for row houses by the 1910s in Queens and Brooklyn, including the designated Chester Court Historic District shown here. The storybook style took root after the Tudor revival during the 1920s, drawing upon medieval and arts and crafts traditions, as well as fantasy architecture. The storybook may be seen as an expressive variant of the Tudor revival or as on 222nd and 227th Street as a style of its own. Originating in California in the 1920s, the storybook style merged medieval precedents with fairy tale illustrations and the aesthetics of Hollywood, the embodiment of glamour, fantasy, and romance. The fanciful adaptation of traditional Tudor elements, use of bright colors and exaggerated curving forms and ornament with a playfully pasted on appearance are all characteristic of the style. On 227th Street, the vertically stretched entrance vestibules with flared eaves, half timbering, diamond pane windows and stucco fields with randomly laid brick and stone accents are typical of the storybook style. 
So too are the whimsical red, blue, and green slate shingles with ragged edges implying great age. Storybook features of the 222nd Street houses include their Tudor arched window openings, brightly colored terracotta roofs and windows, brick facades with random stone accents, and whimsically decorated chimneys with patterned brick and stucco panels. The rows of expressive facades give the street a stage set quality, consistent with the storybook style of a Hollywood backdrop or fairy tale illustration come to life. In planning the 222nd and 227th Street districts, builders adapted a model first widely used in the mid 1920s in Jackson Heights. Driveways behind the houses provide access to rear garages, relegating automobiles to the interior of the block and allowing for continuous landscaped front gardens. The effect is especially striking on 227th Street shown here, where the front gardens remain almost completely uninterrupted and open. Both the 222nd and 227th Street developments were started in the spring of 1931 and began selling by the fall. By the end of summer, the developers of both streets entered an agreement with builders of similar developments nearby to market their houses collectively as quote, parkway homes of St. Albans. 227th Street was also promoted individually in the Brooklyn Eagle and other local newspapers. Advertisements noted the houses eight rooms and brick construction and their location on the gateway to the Southern State Parkway. The attractive pricing included a private garage and was in keeping with Wallace Off Brothers intention that the salaried man earning $50 a week can buy a house with as little financial effort as would be involved in paying rent. The location of St. Albans, Long Island emphasized the suburban setting. Hey, can I just interrupt? Oh, never mind. I was worried the slides weren't moving. Oh, it just moved. I didn't know if it was me or for everybody. The long one. <laughs> um, initially, residents of both 222nd and 227th streets were white middle class families. Black families began moving to Cambria Heights by the 1950s, often overcoming opposition, even overt hostility from some white residents and real estate brokers. By the 1980s, they were joined by immigrant families from Caribbean countries such as Jamaica, Haiti, Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana and Barbados. Today, Cambria Heights remains one of several prosperous, predominantly black residential communities in southeastern Queens. The following slides uh, show staff's analysis of the two districts and we're starting here with 222nd Street. Built by a single developer, Selective Homes, Incorporated in 1931, both sides of the proposed Cambria Heights 222nd Street district share the same storybook style. So this is showing their date and their style. Um, and both sides of, of the block are exceptionally well preserved. The vast majority of the 46 houses um, in the proposed Cambria Heights 222nd Street district have high integrity, with many retaining their historic wood entrance doors and wood first story windows with cheerful pastel colored diamond panes, which is a signature feature of the style. Um, although most of the front gardens remain intact and landscaped, about a quarter have brick and iron fences similar to those on the right, which slightly break up their continuity and visibility from the street. Even with these changes, uh, we felt the street stands out among Queens Row houses of this era for its uh, unusually whimsical design, especially visible in its brick and stucco chimneys, no two of which are alike. Moving to 227th Street, uh, this is also showing the date and style, which is very consistent, all houses built in 1931 in the storybook style. Um, and the proposed 227th Street District is also highly intact without notable changes to any of its 50 houses. Many of the houses retain their historic doors and sashes, including large first story wood windows with brightly colored diamond panes. And the uninterrupted lawns here are really quite striking. Um, both proposed districts were developed with row houses sharing common rear driveways. These alleyways are private, unmapped streets, providing access to garages in the rear, either in the basement or a rear extension in the proposed 222nd Street Historic District on the left, or in separate structures in the proposed 227th Street on the right. 
And these are utilitarian structures um, that face a private driveway and are considered non-contributing. With their fanciful storybook style designs, these blocks um, are among the architectural highlights of the Cambria Heights neighborhood in southeastern Queens and the significant historic character of both proposed 222nd Street and 227th Street historic districts remains remarkably intact. And I just wanted to come back to the public hearing testimony um, where we did hear some questions from residents about LPC regulation. So we took additional time for more outreach and more careful conversations with property owners in both districts to provide information about working with LPC and the benefits and responsibilities of historic district designation. This included um, an in-person meeting, which is the picture here um, from last September, which was our first um, in-person meeting after the start of the pandemic. We held it in a community garden just outside the district and it was very well, well attended. And a lot of people came and we were able to talk with many homeowners. Um, we also held um, virtual office hours. So uh, homeowners could talk to LPC staff one-on-one -on -one, and preservation staff joined us for that. And we were able to answer questions there as well. And we've also kept up really, uh, you know, continuing conversations with individual homeowners. We heard a lot of questions about stained glass windows in particular through this. And so we partnered with the Landmarks Conservancy to offer a workshop for the homeowners um, in both districts to learn more about um, repair methods and resources for these features. Um, so this all has been very productive and, and we're very happy to be presenting these today for a vote. Uh, and I'll just conclude to say the research staff um, and Mike Karatsis um, really worked on these and wrote the, did all the research for a part of the city we really didn't have much on and wrote the reports and also Marianne Hurley and Bill Gay Kosa on the staff helped with the um, building entries. And research staff recommends that the commission vote to designate the East 25th Street Historic District. Thank you. Thank you. I'm right. oh, sorry, that was <laughs> left over. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 222nd Street and 227th Street Historic Districts. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, we have a question from Commissioner Gustafson. Please go ahead. Yeah, it's uh, probably a, more like a series of questions. Um, you know, the, the, the next thing that's going to happen is we're going to be sitting here talking about um, what changes can and cannot be made um, in these districts um, should we designate it. So um, to that end, um, uh, I heard that the garages are considered to be um, non-contributing and utilitarian. Um, so if uh, in the event that we're... Um, uh, we're asked about demolition of one of those garages, which are on the tax lots, I assume. Yeah. Um, so you can tell me if I'm wrong there. Um, is demolition of these garages going to be something that um, is acceptable? So that that is the intention of the identifying them as non-contributing because they are utilitarian structures on the private street. Having said that though, any changes to them, including demolition or alterations to them would certainly be under our review for the impact on the historic district as a whole. And so, so, we, so we would, uh, something that would be built in a garage's place, we would, have, we would be determining whether we thought it was contextual. Exactly. Uh, okay, um, on terms of the, uh, we saw that there was a minority of buildings of structures that had uh, brick walls and fences um, in front of them. And as we know, um, in several of the other uh, Queens uh, neighborhoods, we often are asked about um, uh, the addition of uh, brick walls and fencing <laughs> in front of the properties. Uh, where would we be leaning in, in uh, with regard to this district, if someone, one of these um, with the wonderful row of um, lawns there said, well, I need for security, I need a fence and a wall, where do we, where do we go? Yeah, I think this is always a uh, question for us in all of our garden communities. And, um, and I think a lot of it has to do with the context. So on a street where there are a lot of pre-existing fences, it's sometimes easier to find that a new fence will not detract or call attention to itself on the street where there are no fences, that one may be a little more challenging, but sometimes we've also looked at whether it's a wall or a fence or a combination thereof. And 
to, to find some uh, solution that meets the homeowner's needs in a way that preserves transparency and openness to the green space. So I think that that will, you know, we will be handling those on a case by case basis when they come forward, sort of evaluating those same considerations. That okay, so that one could go either way. Um, on um, on the uh, the diamond panes, um, I, I presume that some of the houses have already replaced those. Um, is that correct? Yeah. Um, so so that being the case. Uh, someone comes to us, an applicant comes to us with a, uh, with an effort to uh, um, replace their grandfathered substitutes uh, with something that is similar to the grandfathered item. Um, um, are we leaning towards bringing back the diamond panes? I know we did that workshop. I assume that's what that was for. Yeah, the workshop was for not only replacing missing ones, but maintaining them, which is mm -hmm. also in a sort of uh, a area of a need and, and there were questions about just maintaining them. Um, and I would say, you know, any replacement of a pre-existing non-historic window that um, returns stained glass to the opening would be eligible for a staff level approval. Anything that isn't returning the stained glass would come to the commission. And um, I think we'd have to, again, look at it on a case by case basis. Uh, I can see, um, I can think of other examples where the commission has approved something that evoked the pattern, but not the color, or something that has maybe of some color, but not the exact pattern. So, you know, we have where the windows have been missing, we have allowed for other or have found other sort of solutions that are more evocative than the pre-existing condition to be appropriate as sort of an incremental improvement. So, I, but again, I think we have to see it on a case-by-case -case basis and where it sits in the row and how it stands out within that particular row. Okay, and and then, those will be questions that the commission will have to determine at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I want one final question. Um, um, I, I, I'm sure you're happy about that. Um, the, uh, is that uh, um, is this are these two unique examples of blocks in Cambria Heights, or or is there the potential for um, um, adding other um, uh, other blocks of houses that are in a similar style and condition? Yeah, if you, I can answer that. I think these these really stood out in Cambria Heights, and they stood out within our survey. But we did identify other areas that have blocks with a similar level of really architectural interest and distinctiveness in terms of applying this storybook style. Um, and so I think you know our broader survey has identified that, and we we started here. And I think for sure there's there's really more we can do and look forward to. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, not seeing any other questions. I want to just sort of kick off a discussion, um, noting that as a Queens resident, doing this Queens uh, survey was important to me. And our staff was incredible with Mike Karatsis and Marianne Hurley and Bill Gokose and they did do an extensive survey sort of from mid to Eastern Queens to uh, really look at the row house development here and the use of this particular style to understand it better and to understand are some better than others? Do some use the features of the style more in a more innovative way? And I think that the survey was invaluable for us. And as Kate said, we did identify some other streets. And so it's a good baseline for thinking about other historic districts in mid and eastern Queens. Um, but we really were able to understand the style and understand where it was used in a particularly innovative or creative way. Um, and also where those streets were most intact. And so I, you know, I do look forward to continuing to build on, on this survey in this particular neighborhood, these two streets really, and, and within the larger study, these two streets really did stand out uh, for their sort of whimsical features and, um, and their level of intactness. And 
Um, and I'm just delighted that we are looking at these today. I also want to say, like so, in so many of our recent historic districts, the community was, is incredibly strong and active and was real. they were really a pleasure to work with. And I want to also um, uh, uh, comment or, or thank Ben Wallen, our, our director of outreach or our coordinator on outreach, who really worked with the property owners between each of the major events we had. He had individual ongoing conversations with them all. And, and I can't express how important these relationships are when we begin this process. And as we move forward, in, in our continued relationship after a designation. So I wanna acknowledge Ben's hard work as well and really thank the community for engaging with us and talking to us about our interest and what concerns and questions they had and um, sort of watching them evolve as a community with the idea of this as a potential designation. So I really wanna thank the community. Um, so with that, does anyone else have any comments they'd like to add? My Queens commissioners, other Queens commissioners, or Commissioner Goldblum. Okay, please go ahead. Not from Queens. Not from Queens. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless. Um, so this is an interesting application, and it's one of a series that we've been, you know, the commission has been looking at recently. And it's interesting to me for a couple of reasons. First of all, I think that the um, integration of extensive aggressive outreach as you were just talking about is, is so important in doing this kind of thing. Um, getting people on board, connecting resources in the private sector, uh, using the staff to do that. All of that I think are examples of good government and good policy and um, uh, are a model I think for other, other places and, and other districts and other cities. Uh, it's really, it's the basis of a successful, um, a successful uh, designation, uh, if you ask me. Because you know, hopefully, with you know, a these are very small. Hopefully, we won't see a lot of the uh, uh, "oh, I didn't know" uh, kind of thing that we often do see with new districts. Because you've really been able to deal with people on a granular basis, and I think that's very strong. The other thing that strikes me about it is the. I don't think there's any architectural historian who you would ask who would say that this is high art, that these are noteworthy because of their architecture, like Grand Central or like the Chrysler Building, for instance. Um, uh, the, this is, you know, as, as the designation report discusses, these are uh, uh, kind of silly, kind of goofy, kind of cinematic, kind of uh, whimsical, um, that was a word used. And I think that that's true, but it doesn't mean that they don't merit designation. So it makes me think about, you know, um, uh, what does merit designation? How does designation work and what's it doing? I, I think what it's doing here is it's recognizing a, a, a place that has its own atmosphere, that has its own quality, that's self-contained in a funny way, but that makes its own little world out of a very big city. And I think that um, that can happen even if it doesn't rise to the level of uh, masterclass architecture. Uh, and I think that, that it, 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 it fulfills the mandate of the commission, even, even, at, even though the architecture is not, let's say, you know, uh, capital, capital A architecture. Um, and I think that as a, and that plus the cultural aspect of the development of the neighborhood, um, those, those go to kind of, for me, making a, a, a clearer understanding of what a district is. And, and I think that this therefore is totally appropriate as a district. Thank you. Yes, and, and when you walk into these streets, there is definitely a sense of place that is, as you say, atmospheric. Commissioner Chapin, please go ahead. Yeah, sorry, it was a different computer. So I was having some issues with the raise your hand and the <coughs> mute button. Anyway, uh, it's really, uh, this is just a beautiful area with a charming architecture and uh, 
I want to congratulate the owners on the very well preserved historic sense of place, which we've been talking about. It's it's just terrific. So, and I'm very uh, pleased to hear about all the efforts that were made with the community because that is so important, as uh, Michael was just saying. Uh, anyway, I, I think it's uh, great that we found this area to designate. It's uh, very well, very appropriate. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Commissioner Chen, please go ahead. Just want to echo my fellow commissioners uh, and as well uh, compliment the team and Cape uh, Lemos for a job well done. Uh, anytime you can feature uh, Goldilocks, um, um, <laughs> you have me on your side. Uh, <laughs> but it's, uh, I, I had to commend you for the extensive outreach, especially given the, uh, yeah, so the challenging Lemos. times we live in. Uh, and uh, Michael Goldblum is uh, so yeah, correct that this is so important as well as Diana's comment. Thank you. Great, anyone else? Oh, great. Okay, so um, with that, what I'd like to do is make a motion to designate each of these historic districts. There are two historic districts. Um, so first I would um, ask Commissioner Chapin, if you would make a motion to designate the Cambria Heights 222nd Street Historic District. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I move that the Landmarks Preservation Commission designate the Cambria Heights 222nd Street Historic District, Borough of Queens, as the New York City Historic District, because it contains buildings and other improvements which have a special character and a special historical and aesthetic interest and value, and which represent one or more eras in the history of New York City, and which cause this area, by reason of these factors, to constitute a distinct section of the city. Further, this historic district is part of the development, heritage, and culture of the city, state, and nation, as set forth in the designation report for LP 2655, dated June 26, 2022. I also move that the district be designated with the boundaries as described in the designation report and illustrated in the attached map. All right, thank you. And Commissioner Gustafson, would you second that motion? Second. Thank you. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Commissioner Jefferson, you're on mute. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. With nine in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. Thank you. And now we'll move to the Cambria Heights 227th Historic District. And Commissioner Chen, can I ask you to make that motion as our other Queens resident? Sure, uh, with pleasure. Uh, I move that the Landmarks Preservation Commission designate the Cambria Heights 222nd Street Historic District, Borough of Queens as a New York City Historic District because it contains buildings and other improvements which have a special character and a special historic and aesthetic interest and value and which represents one or more eras in the history of New York City and which caused this area by reason of these factors to constitute a distinct section of, of the city. Further, this historic district is part of the development, heritage and culture of the city, state and nation as set forth in the destination report for LP-2655 dated June 28, 2022. I also move that this is, the district be designated with the boundaries as described in the destination report and illustrated in the attachment. Thank you. And Commissioner Goldblum, would you second that I just, motion? Sorry, I just want to, that's oh. LP-2656, just to correct the, the record. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Commissioner Goldblum, would you second that motion? Second. Thank you, Mark, will you call the vote? Mark, you're on mute. Sorry, I thought Sarah was on mute. Uh, Chair Carroll. Hi. 
Commissioner Samir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. With nine in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. Right, that's approved as well. And I'm delighted today. Thank you all for um, this discussion and this vote. Um, and we now have our two most recent historic districts in Southeast Queens in Cambria Heights. Thank you very much. And we'll move to the next item. Great, thank you. Um, our third item this morning is LP 2662, uh, the Lesbian Herstory Archives at 484 14th Street in Brooklyn, block 1103, lot 31. Proposed for the commission's calendar is a Renaissance Revival style row house designed by Axel Hedman and constructed in 1908 that has housed the Lesbian Herstory Archives since 1991. And presenting this this morning is the Deputy Director of Research, Margaret Herman. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, next slide. Okay. Uh, 484 14th Street in Park Slope, Brooklyn is culturally significant as the home since 1991 of the Lesbian History Archives, the nation's oldest and largest collection of lesbian related historical material. The organization's headquarters for over 30 years, this building is where the archives expanded its collection, grew to national prominence, and continues to serve as a vital educational organization, community space, and center for lesbian history and culture. The building is on 14th Street between 8th Avenue and Prospect Park West but, uh, within Brooklyn's Park Slope Historic District. The proposed landmark site consists of the tax lot, Block 1103, Lot 31. The Lesbian History Archives is an entirely volunteer run nonprofit organization founded in 1974 by activists Joan Nessel, Deborah Edel, and others, housed until 1991 in Nessel and Edel's apartment on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. The archives began as a grassroots attempt to end the silence around lesbian history and to create a physical archive for study, analysis, and community gathering. At a time when the LGBTQ community faced enormous legal and social discrimination, the archives fought to bring lesbian cultural artifacts into public view and to normalize them as an integral piece of American history. The project was national in scope from its early years and was intentionally feminist in nature, using the term herstory to note the rejection of patriarchy. It was also inclusive with women of color counted among the organization's early supporters and contributors. The image on the left shows early members participating in the second annual Gay Academic Union Conference at NYU in 1974. The images on the right show volunteers sorting through periodicals and attending a gathering at the archives Upper West Side home in the 1980s. The collection had outgrown its space by 1990 and by 1991 the archives had raised enough funding to purchase 484 14th Street in Park Slope, Brooklyn, which had become a center of the lesbian community in New York City. After more than a year of renovations, the building was transformed into a new headquarters for the archives. The archives were conceived as a living repository and grew to include a wide variety of materials dating from the 1950s to the present with a national scope, collected and donated by lesbians themselves. Materials in the archives include periodicals, files on lesbian activists and community groups, oral histories, and the personal and professional papers of lesbians from a diversity of cultural, ethnic, and class-based communities. Among many others, significant collections include those of the organization's Daughters of Belitis, the Salsa Soul Sisters, and the New York chapter of ACT UP, as well as papers of Archives co-founder Joe Nessel, 1960s LGBTQ organizer Barbara Giddings, and the African-American activists Mabel Hampton and Audre Lorde. Since 1991, the Archives has continued to grow its collection, adding materials relating to more recent lesbian individuals and organizations, and to issues like lesbian parenthood, political organizing in the 1990s, and the marriage equality cases of the 21st century. Over the last two decades, the archives has greatly increased public access by digitizing a significant portion of their collections, including photographs, audiovisual materials, and archives newsletters. Shown here are images of a digitized newsletter from 2001 and online exhibits of digitized video and audio files from the Daughters of Belitis and ACT UP. 
Over the last 30 years, the archives has also increased their national reputation by holding numerous volunteer-led events and traveling exhibitions across the United States and at their home in Park Slope. The images here highlight a small sample of these events, including a talk given in Illinois in 1993, a gallery exhibition of lesbian pulp paperback covers in Hawaii in 1999, and a marathon reading of work by Audre Lorde and Adrian Rich held at the archives in 2012. The archives has also contributed extensively to important LGBTQ exhibitions at larger institutions, such as the New York Public Library in 1994 and the New York Historical Society in 2019. The archives home at 484 14th Street is located just west of Prospect Park within the Park Slope Historic District, designated in 1973. The historic district is a residential neighborhood consisting of intact late 19th and early 20th century streetscapes featuring row houses of a mostly uniform height designed in a variety of styles. 484 14th Street was originally a two-family home designed by Axel Hedman for the Prospect Park Realty Company in 1908. It was designed in the French Renaissance Revival style as part of a row of seven similar limestone fronted row houses with alternating curved and angled bays. Because the historic district designation predated the archives arrival in 1991, there's no mention of the building's role in LG, LGBTQ and women's history. Designating 484 14th Street as an individual landmark would highlight this important story and emphasize an additional period of significance associated with the lesbian history archives. Since purchasing 484 14th Street in 1991, the archives has diligently maintained the building and it retains a high degree of integrity and historic character within the surrounding streetscape. In the early 1990s, the organization worked with LPC to implement limited alterations related to accessibility, security improvements, and window changes necessary for the building's new use as a nonprofit and repository of archival materials. As a nationally important collection of LGBTQ historical materials, the Lesbian History Archives plays an essential role in telling the story of a mostly unseen community of women who contributed to America's cultural, political, and social history. 484 14th Street has been the organization's home for over 30 years, where it has continued to collect important materials, expand its scope, and serve researchers and the public. The research department recommends that the commission calendar the Lesbian History Archives as an individual landmark. Thank you, Margaret. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Okay, not seeing any questions. Um, I just want to note that, um, you know, since we did a designated Stonewall Inn and then our subsequent LGBT initiative um, where we designated um, a number of institutions and homes of influential people who uh, were active in the, the movement. Um, we have, as a team, continued to identify sites and look for sites, and we've worked closely with the LGBT Historic Sites Project, so we want to thank them for their cooperation and, uh, and collaboration with, uh, with us. Um, and this particular site, as Margaret said, is um, uh, in a, a district that predates the history here. And so this designation would recognize this history that is so important to LGBTQ, but also women's history. And um, this National Archive is actually an archive that our own research staff has used. And I think it is um, invaluable across the nation. So I'm delighted that we're considering it. And I think that uh, Commissioner Gustafson, you have a question. So I'll let you go ahead. Yeah, um, as, as a, the, the structure is already in um, an historic district, correct? Correct. And um, and we're um, design we're designating an, indiv an individual landmark, and we're designating it for uh, cultural reasons. So my question is, how does our regulatory um, activity change with regard to this particular um, structure, uh, as opposed to, for example, the building adjacent to it and connected to it? And I think that part of, um, well, I don't know if that's me echoing, but I think that what I would say is um, the appearance of it, it during the time that it, it has been occupied by Her Story Archives is um, very similar to the appearance of its neighbors. It still has its 19th century appearance. So that period of uh, significance as it relates to the architecture, I think, is lends itself to regulating the architecture in a way that we would 
um, its neighbors. Um, having said that though, as, as Margaret described, they have worked with LPC to make a number of changes to the exterior to reflect their use and presence. And I, uh, in, oh, I embrace those changes. I think it does, it's important that it does say there's something here, there's something here that's accessible to the public, something here that people, um, where people are welcome to come and do research. And so I do think to the extent that there are changes that reflect this use and support the use, we would consider those as well. Uh, you know, for example, some signage and um, other changes that allow for the public to know that they're there and to enter into the building easily. So hypothetically speaking, if it was, um, if, it had, if it had been radically altered um, individually, um, as opposed to the rest of the right. buildings and, the, and during the period of relevance, then we would have regulated to the period of relevance. That's correct. So for example, the James Baldwin house is in the upper east, west side of the district, yeah. but had a 1950s white brick facade that might otherwise not have been considered significant, but that dated to his period. And so that we will consider that a significant layer. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, well, again, I'm, I'm very excited to be recognizing the Lesbian and Her, Her Story archives um, at this particular moment as we wrap up Pride Month um, and also recognize the significance of women in, in our nation today. So um, Commissioner Luffy, would you make a motion to calendar this item for consideration? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you second mm -hmm. that motion? Second. Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, so the item is considered, uh, is calendared and we will consider it in the near future at a public hearing. Thank you. We'll now move to our preservation department agendas. Okay, thank you, Sarah, and good morning, everyone. Uh, we're gonna start today's preservation department agenda with public meeting item, public meeting item number one. That's LPC 22-08221, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1183, lot 46, 330 West 72nd Street in the West End Collegiate Historic District Extension. This is a medieval revival slash art deco style apartment building designed by George and Edward Bloom built in 1927. And the application is to replace windows. This was last presented at the public hearing of May 17th, 2022, and no action was taken at that time. Uh, the staff will do a brief recap of that presentation, and then we'll turn it over to the applicant after we open the proceedings. Okay, so why don't we, if we are anticipating the applicant speaking, if we could go ahead and open the proceedings now so that that can be seamless, let's do that. All right, um, Commissioner Gustafson, would you make a motion to open the proceedings? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the applicant may speak after the staff presents. Hey, commissioners. Um, Janelle, you now have control of the presentation. You just need to click on your screen and then unmute yourself once you've clicked on your screen. Okay. Janelle, are you having um, issues with? Yes, it just disconnected me. Okay. I'm going to try to give this back to you again. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Good morning, commissioners. Janelle Gunther, preservation staff. The item before you is 330 West 72nd Street in the West End Collegiate Historic District Extension. Um, the building is located mid-block on the south side of West 72nd Street between West End Avenue and Riverside Boulevard. Um, this was last presented to you as a public hearing item on May 17th of this year. Let's advance. Okay. Here is a historic photo showing the subject property toward the left-hand side of the image. And here is a detail view, or two detail views of the same photograph. 
And these are some designation photos of the building. The proposal is to install metal one over one, double hung windows at one apartment at the seventh floor of the West 72nd Street facade. At the public hearing, there were six commissioners present, and those who were present expressed a consensus to, of support to install the historic window configuration and did not support the proposal to install one over one windows. However, no action was taken at that time. Please note, as documented in the designation photos, that multiple windows with a three over one configuration were present at several different floors on the facade, and the staff believes this is the historic configuration. The proposal and presentation materials remain as originally presented and the applicant would like the commission to take an action. The applicant is present and would like to make an additional statement. Okay, the applicant may go ahead and speak. Do we have the applicant in the meeting? Yes, yes. I, I've been unmuted. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. So um, thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to address the LPC. Um, I, I have a very brief presentation and I'm not going to repeat the presentation that I made, which was quite extensive in terms of um, the historic research that I conducted into the notable architects, Blum and Blum, who were unknown to me, but are now very well known to me, who built um, my building in 1927. And this is significant. This is something that I am extremely emotional about. Uh, it involves my future uh, residents in my unit um, at, of 7B. I have lived in the, on the Upper West Side and I'm a member of that community since uh, 1968. I have lived in my building, in my unit since 1971. At all times during my occupancy, I had the same one over one double hung windows. Um, <clears throat> my, uh, and you've already seen slides, my art collection, everything that I have is, is affected by what I perceive to be this erroneous designation of a prairie style three over one window, but I, I won't discuss it at this point. Moving on to the law, because I think what is really important is that the administrative code section 25307 is triggered whenever an applicant intends to do anything where a certificate of no effect is denied. In this particular case, I am applying for a certificate of um, uh, that that is required and which requires the Landmark Preservation Commission to consider the effect of the proposed work in analyzing two different factors. Actually, there are three. First is the effect of the change that I am proposing, which is not a change, it is the replacement of one over one windows on my facade in changing or destroying the architectural features of the structure on which the work is done, 330 West 72nd Street. The second factor under the law that you're supposed to be considering is the effect of the um, change that I'm making on the exterior architectural features of neighboring buildings, the adjacent structures, and then of course, on the entire West Side Historic District in which my building is located. The law as decided by the courts of the state of New York explicitly provides that that decision must be based on architectural and aesthetics factors, not on economic factors. 
And I'm not here arguing to you that being forced to put these three over one windows is going to affect uh, the um, value of my apartment. Although I'm, you know, putting windows with bars on in front of a facade that has a dynamite view, of course, will impact its value. That's not my argument. So I want to look first at the idea of no effect on a significant architectural feature of the building. At the time of the designation, the building had no historic windows. The designation report of 2013 said that on the basis of the 1939 tax photos describing the historic window as six over one or six over six. So at the time of designation, the report of the Landmarks Commission said that the historic windows of my building were six over one or six over six. At that time of designation, there were only two units, unit 8A and unit 7A that had three over one facade windows. Therefore, at the time of designation in 2013, as shown in slide 11 of my presentation, there were zero historic windows as provided in the designated report. And of the historic windows that the commission later imposed upon the first applicant after the Landmarks Preservation Law who wanted to change windows, the three over one window, at the time of designation, there were six out of a total of 190 facade windows that had three over one. Master plan, my building, has a hodgepodge of windows. The building never had, and on information that I have obtained subsequent to the hearing, has no intention of ever having a master plan according to the 330 West 72nd Street Corporation. At the public hearing on my case, a lobbyist for the Historic District Council said that it was a civic duty for my co-op board to adopt a master plan to impose three over one windows on the occupants and shareholders of my building. My co-op board does not agree with this. In the unlikely event that a master plan were to be adopted, it would certainly not be three over one windows or six over one windows, which are frowned on based on my survey of most of the inhabitants of my building. Like every other Blum and Blum building that I have encountered in my research on the Upper West Side and throughout the city, every Blum and Blum historic window that has been replaced has been replaced by one over one double hung windows without any impact on the aesthetic of the building. The fact that my building is in a disgraceful hodgepodge is distressing to me as somebody who really likes architecture, but forcing me to install three over one windows will not correct the hodgepodge. At the same time that it brings extraordinary harm to me, the applicant who has lived there and benefited from the security of place and sense of place that I have from the windows that have been installed in my residence. Um, on balancing the equities, the facade will never be uniform six over six to conform to the original architectural intent or three over one in my lifetime, which is uh, 20 years at best, to any of yours. No shareholder has the intent of replacing a skyline tilt and turn window 
on the facade with a three over one and will do whatever is possible and whatever it costs to repair and maintain to avoid going to the Landmarks Preservation Commission. So my PowerPoint showed with respect to the next elements, the effect on the neighborhood and adjacent structures. Three over one windows, if anything, are inconsistent with the adjacent structures and with the Upper West Side Historic District. The Upper West Side Historic District is dominated by one over one double hung windows. And the adjacent structures to mine, like 277 West End Avenue, 322 West 72nd Street, and the Chatworth all have uh, all have compatible windows with what I am about to install. I am unaware of any similar factual situation as precedent for the LPC to deny the application for a certificate of appropriateness. In, in the event that they did, I can only say that it has often been stated here that the Landmarks Commission has no authority to impose co-ops to adopt a master plan. What the Landmarks Preservation Commission is attempting to do here, as it has done in other instances, is to use a single application to begin to impose um, an, a, a master plan, implicitly doing what it cannot legally do explicitly. And, by, and the fact that in this presentation, there is a mention to the fact that the co-op, I mean, the building facade has numbers of three over one windows, given the statistics that I have brought to you, is that all the other three over one windows, other than in 7A and 8A, were imposed on the applicant who did not want to go through the expense and the time and many which the Landmarks Preservation Commission seems to refuse to accept is a reason why many of these uh, windows are accepted because of the fact that people want to get the job done and don't want to spend sixteen to twenty thousand dollars to hire an architect to make a presentation. In conclusion, I will say that my community board, where I have lived for over fifty years in my community, uh, community board number seven passed a res resolution 33 in favor of, no, uh, of the fact that this was appropriate and that a certificate of appropriateness should, should issue. There were zero against, three abstentions, and one present. And I think that their reasoning uh, is appropriate here uh, unless, uh, to support my uh, certificate of appropriateness. They said, to the extent that there is any doubt about the windows, it was not completely clear to the members of the preservation community what the original window configuration on the facade had been, six over one or three over one. Also, the current windows on the facade consist of a wide variety of different types. Um, I incorporate in my statement, my presentation of the previous uh, hearing, and I would say only that um, I feel that correctly applying the criteria as the commission must that are set forth in the administrative code, that it is only if they do not do the analysis required to the facts and apply those factors and use the mantra of a window as a historic window as the basis for imposing this decision. Uh, that is the only reason that I would not be granted a certificate of appropriateness. And particularly in this case, when the question of which historic window to impose, six over one or three over one, is in question. And as I mentioned before, anybody who studied the Blum and Blum, and I know that most of you are architectural historians, 
the idea that they would consider a prairie style window architecturally significant, given the fact that every single one of their buildings has been based on a grid of windows, even though the decoration changed in the 1920s to the 30s, is totally uh, denying what the architects represented. I don't know, maybe they got a good deal on three over one windows, if in fact that was a thing on Canal Street. Certainly the building is less decorated than some of them. But in any event, the Landmarks Commission itself determined that the windows were six over one. Uh, I'm not asking for six over one, I'm asking to replace what I have and continue to live in my apartment as I have for the last 50 years, rather than to have to move because of the psychological impact of having bars on my windows. Thank you okay. very much for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Hoffman. All right, um, commissioners, do we have any final questions? Okay, let's move to our discussion. So I'm gonna start to request, uh, send requests maybe, maybe. to unmute. Okay. So yeah, commissioner so Jefferson, would you make a motion to close the not, hearing? I, I saw a motion. And Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And I know the um, applicant has raised questions about the historic configuration. And I'll just say, commissioners, that at the time that we designated this historic district, which is one of the largest historic districts in the city, um, we do a sort of a, a high level building by building analysis for our building entries. And um, at that time in the designation report, it said that the windows appeared to be six over one or six over six. Um, we sometimes find that at the time of designation upon further research, when the staff digs deeper into each building, a different uh, set of circumstances. And so in this case, there were pre-existing uh, nine three over one wood windows, uh, which are seen in the historic photographs. So. Uh, the staff has done extensive analysis and is confident about the historic configuration, but that is not the question before us today. The applicant is asking for a one over one double hung window. Um, and, the, uh, and the question of what the historic configuration is something that would be resolved at staff level should the, sta uh, should the applicant be proposing to match and meet the rules. Um, to match the historic configuration. So the question before us is whether or not a one over one double hung window is appropriate in this particular building, given the conditions that are before us today. And that is that there um, is a combination of and a variety of window types. We know that there were nine historic windows at the time of designation. There have been some approvals for new uh, three over one historic windows. So that number has gone up a little bit, but certainly there is a combination of window types here. Um, and as you know, in the, pa in the uh, distant past, the commission in buildings where the majority of the historic windows were gone at the time of designation had allowed a one over one configuration as part of a master plan to achieve uniformity in lieu of the historic condition. The application before us today is not a master plan and, and nor would we compel the building to come forward to the master plan as that is only an administrative tool to help a building get quicker approvals. Um, but we have uh, in both applications for master plans and for individual apartments in the last 10 years or so, we have um, started to look at these applications more carefully and to think about when it is appropriate to allow a change in configuration and when we think the historic configuration is important. And that has, often has to do with the style of the building the uh, ornament and level of decoration on the building that expresses the style or, and, or how, le how legible the style is without the windows, um, the context in the streetscape, how prominent the building is. And given that this is a, a relatively 
um, simple facade and highly prominent. I think at the last public hearing, there was a quorum of commissioners who all felt that the proposed windows should match, should match that new windows should match the historic configuration and therefore did not support the proposal for the one over one double hung window. Um, we didn't take an action at that time. Um, but I think now we do need to conclude that discussion and actually vote on a, um, the application so that the applicant can make decisions on how to move forward. So the question before us today is whether or not the one over one configuration is appropriate on this particular building, given its style, um, its design and its uh, location within the historic district. So we'll begin. Commissioner Devonshire, would you like to start this discussion? Yes, very simply, I believe that the original configuration is the one that's appropriate in this case. Thank you. Commissioner uh, Chen? Yeah, I, I agree with the Commissioner uh, Devonshire. Commissioner Lutfi? I agree that it's more appropriate, the three over one. What, right, then a one over one. That question is whether a one over one is appropriate. No, I understand. No, I don't believe it's appropriate. Okay. Commissioner Jefferson. I think you're muted. Just request, accept the request to unmute. I don't, I'm always muted. Um, <laughs> um, I agree with Commissioner Devonshire. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Gustafson. Yeah, uh, just to highlight um, a couple of things that um, that um, you said, Chair Carroll, um, the uh, the building itself has very little ornamentation, and that is usually our um, the, it's the trigger for us to um, determine what how important the um, the windows are the, the original window configuration is um, in that context. Um, the um, whether it was three or six. Um, uh, doesn't make much difference to us in making that decision. We're asked here solely to determine whether one over one is appropriate. Um, and um, and, and uh, in this instance, um, uh, I, don't, I don't think that it is appropriate. Um, and, and frankly, I think the applicant made a, um, unfortunately made a good argument um, or made a, some argument for six over one, which um, I don't think that's what she actually wants, but um, in any event, um, and in terms of, um, you know, the long-term um, uh, impact of that decision, um, she is correct that this will be done on a, you know, one-by-one -one basis. Um, but the, 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 the fact is that we designate these buildings not for um, our lifetimes, mine or yours, um, but for um, uh, theoretically ad infinitum. Um, and over the course of time, um, you know, forever right or forever wrong, we can we can cement the error, or we can um, um, or we can build to um, uh, a consistent future at some point down the road, and probably long after I'm gone. Thank you, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Oh, I think she had to step away. All right, Commissioner Chapin. Uh, I agree with Commissioner Devonshire and Commissioner Gustafson's uh, points about the uh, the simplicity in this case of the building and the need for some uh, additional decoration, which the architect intended uh, at the beginning. So in this case, I feel that uh, the one over one is not appropriate. Thank you, Commissioner Goldblum. Uh, no disagreement. Um, I, I think that the applicant has raised a lot of uh, concerns and, and articulated them very clearly. And I think it would be to her advantage to have a, have a discussion with, with uh, Mark Silberman uh, about some of the ins and outs of her comments. But I think that, that our decision as a commission um, is as you and, and John and, and Michael have discussed it to be. Uh, and I think that the, um, there's no question in my mind that, that the, the one over ones uh, are not appropriate to this building and that the, um, the design of the windows is no different, in my view, than the design of the, 
cornice over the second floor or the cornice uh, at, the, at the top of the building. Um, and that uh, it is a, a decorative element that forms a part of the fabric of this district and of this building and that it is an integral part of it. And its absence uh, is uh, uh, not to be uh, perpetuated, but to be uh, fixed. And if it, if it takes one application or, or 50 applications, um, I think our job as a commission is to enhance the district and the building. And this uh, determination, I believe, will do that. Okay. All right. Thank you. So I think we have a consensus to deny the application for the one over one double home windows. Commissioner Devonshire, would you make the motion? The matter of LPC 22082213 West 72nd Street in the West End Collegiate <laughs> Extension, an application to replace windows. I recommend denial, finding that the building's ornamentation is restrained. Therefore, the texture and pattern of the historic window configuration is a significant feature of the design and composition of the building that the proposed one over one windows will not match the historic three over three windows in terms of configuration, which contribute to the unique medieval revival art deco style of the building. That the historic three over one double hung windows existed at mm -hmm. several locations throughout the building at the time of designation. Therefore, the proposed one over one double hung windows will detract from the existing examples of the historic configuration and the proposed work will diminish the special architectural and historic character of the building and the West End Collegiate Historic District Extension. Thank you. Commissioner Gustafson, would you second that motion? Second. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. She's still absent. Commissioner Chapin. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. With eight in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. All right, so uh, the one over one uh, double hung windows are denied here and the applicant may continue to work with the staff um, uh, pursuing an option that would match the historic windows uh, should they wish to continue to replace the windows. All right, we'll move to the next item now. And the next item is public hearing item number one, LPC 22-09533. This is an application for an amendment in the Borough of Manhattan Block 40, Lot 3, 60 Wall Street. Uh, this is a postmodern style office tower designed by Roche Stinkaloo and built in 1985-89 pursuant to a special permit under zoning resolution section 74-79, which found a harmonious relationship between the building and the individual landmark at 55 Wall Street, which is a Greek revival style exchange building designed by Isaiah Rogers, built in 1842, with an addition designed by McKim, Mead and White, built in 1907. The application is to amend CR 85-004 to alter the base of 60 Wall Street. Hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Hugh, you now have control of the presentation. You just need to click on your screen. Uh, and Commissioner Blum, I'm sorry. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to <clears throat> give the commissioners a, a little bit more background. So commissioners, in August of 1984, the commission approved a positive report pursuant to an application of the city planning commission under 7479, <clears throat> supporting the transfer of more than 30, 363,000 square feet of development rights from 55 Wall Street, an individual landmark across the street to the site at 60 Wall Street, and for certain modifications to heighten setback regulations. Um, the application required the commission to approve a continuing maintenance program which the Landmark Conservancy currently oversees and to find a harmonious relationship between the landmark and the new building. In finding a harmonious relationship due to the design, choice of material and location of the new building in relation to the landmark, the commission found that 
the, um, and I'm summarizing here, the colonnaded base conforms to the street wall set up by the buildings along the length of Wall Street, including 55 Wall, at the height, rhythm, and massing of the ground floor colonnade related to the landmark scale, that the choice of granite for the facade of the proposed building is, uh, will complement 55 Wall, uh, that the basic form of the colonnade is contemporary and as such is not duplicative of the landmark, but rather a sensitive response to it, and that the tower portion of the building is well integrated with the base through the use of stepped setbacks. Um, the application concerns altering the base of 60 wall, as you will see. You are being asked whether there is still a harmonious relationship between the new design and 55 Wall Street. I note that when considering a harmonious relationship, the building typically looks, the commission typically looks primarily at the base of the new building in connection with the smaller landmark buildings, although the commission does consider the new building in its entirety. So with that, I'll turn it over to the applicant. Thank you, or if you have any questions, happy to answer them. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Corey. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Melanie Myers with Brief Frank. I'm the land use counsel for the applicant. And Hugh, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, as Corey and Mark both indicated, the application before you is for a revised report relating to the harmonious relationship between 55 Wall Street, a New York City landmark located on the south side of Wall Street, um, and 60 Wall Street, a late 1980s non-landmark office building located on the north side of Wall Street between William and Pearl Streets. As you know, the original 60 Wall Street was designed by the architectural firm of Roach Dicolu and has a tripartite design with a modern office tower shaft located between a postmodern base and tower top, a prevailing style in the 1980s. So the revisions that we are asking the commission to consider would replace the base of the 60 Wall Street building with a lighter modern design that transitions into the modern tower shaft while leaving a postmodern top as an element in the lower Manhattan skyline. Um, a little bit of background, uh, 60 Wall was built pursuant to a special permit, as was just mentioned, approved in 1984, that increased the floor area on the site through two mechanisms. First, the special permit allowed for the transfer of 363,000 square feet of air rights from the landmark 55 Wall Street under 7479. And this is the portion of the special permit that was accompanied by the harmonious relationship report. In addition, the building also received a floor area bonus of about 150,000 square feet for the provision of a large covered pedestrian space within the base of the building under zoning resolution section 7487. 60 Wall was designed as a financial services building and reflected the then prevailing view of what a bank headquarters should convey. This included an imposing fortress-like entrance and large trading floors in the base of the building with minimal windows. In the 30 plus years since the building was built, however, the needs for office tenants, including financial services tenants, have changed dramatically in terms of needs for light and air, amenity, and accessibility. And as a result of these needs and these changes, the longstanding tenant of the building, Deutsche Bank, announced in May of 2018 that it was moving its New York headquarters to modern office space in Midtown Manhattan. That has happened. Deutsche Bank has now moved and the building stands empty. So while the Deutsche Bank's move was unfortunate for the building and was unfortunate for Lower Manhattan, it has provided the opportunity to address some issues with the building um, that make it challenging for tenancy. These include upgrades to the mechanical systems and the energy efficiency of the building, adding transparency to the base of the lower floors um, to make them more habitable for workers and modernizing the colonnade and the public arcade of the building to create a more inviting, safer, and in our view, a better neighbor to the Wall Street context. If we could go to the next slide, please. And this is just a bit of a summary of what Mark just um, went through. The harmonious relationship did um, findings in 1984 uh, focused on the base, it concluded that the colony base conforms to the street wall, that it's that the building is integrated into the Wall Street context, that the height, rhythm, and massing of the colony relate to 55 walls scale, that the choice of stone was complementary, 
that the tower portion was well integrated in the base through a use of step setbacks, that we aren't casting shadows, and the basic form of the colonnade is not duplicative, but rather contemporary. Um, we believe that the proposal achieves the goals expressed in the original um, report. And in particular, we believe that the KPF design uh, that he was about to show you is an updated, lighter, and more inviting facade than what exists today, but also one that maintains a strong, harmonious relationship with 55 wall through the use of its materials, its columns, and the introduction of screening elements that are reflective of 55 Wall Street, but contemporary in approach. So thank you for your time. And I will now turn it over to Hugh Trumbull of Competitors and Fox to discuss the proposal. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, it's a slide that really illustrates Wall Street and the, uh, the nesting of the proposal into the urban fabric. Uh, it seems to fit right in uh, with the overall fabric with 55 uh, Wall Street across the street, which is uh, the Cipriani under the Cipriani flag. Um, one thing that is maybe a little bit deceiving is that we are really proposing a substantial transformative um, base to the building. Uh, maybe not apparent in this image, but we are trying to prep the building uh, to be competitive uh, and to be occupied for the next 50 years. It is one of the, the most uh, or one of the largest buildings uh, within Wall Street and has up to now one of the greatest populations uh, contributing to the life of the city here. Uh, in addition, we're trying to celebrate the uh, pop space within and to really allow it to be much more of a player and to support the urban realm in a much more substantial way. If we go to the, the next image. Uh, looking at 60 Wall Street from above, uh, looking at this uh, cracked mud area of downtown Manhattan, we see the intimacy of the streets. And uh, we're aware that 55 is quite close to 60, uh, right across the street from one another. Um, but there are kind of two different realms of this area of Manhattan. One is the skyline up above, and one is this very intimate series of streets, fixed end streets. Uh, where the lower part of the building is uh, very present and the upper parts of the buildings are a little bit disjointed from it. So if we go to the next slide, we can see that uh, in these images. Um, to the right and to the left-hand slides, what we see are these oblique views of 60 Wall Street as it is today. Um, and what you note is that the facade tends to collapse to some degree with a lot of dark spaces within the colonnade. Uh, on the right and the left, but we get these moments, uh, particularly at Hanover Street, where we have a perpendicular view into 60 Wall Street. It's actually quite unusual within the urban fabric here, so to be able to see the facade directly. And what we know is that, that uh, the pop space is right beyond that facade, but we can't really see it in this image. And so it was our intention to figure out a way to celebrate that pop space and let it be much more engaged into this urban fabric. So if we go to the next slide, uh, looking at the historic building, uh, 55 across the street, as it been mentioned, it was built in two phases. The bottom uh, colonnade was part of a bank. Uh, the colonnade sits on a piano noble, uh, a noble plane separating the sidewalk from the colonnade. Uh, in the Beaux-Arts era, McKinley Mead and White took the, the kind of traditional style of that contemporary time and placed it, uh, a series of columns on top of it, creating a superimposition of columns, one in uh, Corinthian, the other, uh, the original in Doric down below, following the kind of school of thought at that time. Uh, the other thing that's quite interesting about this image is that the, uh, the blank site in the foreground is what will become 60 Wall Street. So you can see uh, in this image the immediate relationship between the two and not being able to see this building today um, from the kind of general view and trying to get wonderful views of this building going forward. Uh, so if we go to the next image. Um, the original proposal for 60 Wall Street uh, composes three parts. 
Um, the main part, which is the shaft of the tower, was composed of a series of strip windows, very straightforward modernist uh, language that runs around the, the shaft of the tower. And then at the top and the bottom were grafted a somewhat Egyptianate, postmodern style uh, accoutrement. Um, the base has more solid columns. The top is uh, the curtain wall transformed to emulate columns. Um, and it really marked a period of contemporary style in the 80s, which uh, is kind of uh, past today. If we go um, to the next image, what we see is our proposal that also takes and thinks about the, the shaft, but um, as a series of strip windows that transforms itself and comes down into a series of stacked screens. These screens emulate 60 Wall Street stacking of columns in a, in a more abstract way, but it also uh, creates nesting of screens, so screens within screens, which is a detail that exists in 60, or 55 Wall Street as well. Um, and that we feel that it is a much more comfortable and integrated relationship, harmonious to the shaft of the building as it, it makes a series of horizontals that step down and open up the facade to the, the street. Um, this facade provides 50% more vision glass for both the pop space and the, the workspaces within than the present facade today. And that is imperative to position this building for the future of the next 50 years and to bring in the tenants to get it occupied. Go to the next, uh, next image. Uh, here is a uh, uh, image from uh, the Architects Original website. It shows the, the bundle of columns that define the base. It's a group of four columns, two pair on two pair. Behind it is a fairly dark, glass wall that opens to the, the pop space with a, a significant spandrel at the top that really, in some ways in our minds, fights the relationship of the verticality of the columns. And then up on top of those columns, you see this kind of piling of a series of uh, Egyptian eight motifs that go up uh, and define uh, the transition to the shaft or the, the tower up above. If we go to the, the next image, uh, our proposal uh, intends to lighten up the whole facade. So what we've done is we've taken out all of the, the faux columns within the cadence of the colonnade so that you have one where there were two and we've allowed those to breathe, to let the colonnade breathe a bit more. We've created this idea of nesting screens um, that sit within the colonnade uh, that allow those screens to reinforce the rhythm and the sort of mu musicality of the, the cadence as you move up and down the street. It also transforms as we move from this oblique view, uh, walking down uh, Wall Street to a perpendicular view, the, the wall opens up, it expresses the pop space and it draws you in and it really connects what is a very important uh, urban space with the uh, room of the street. If we go to the next image. Here is a, a Noli plan that tries to uh, describe the relationship of in, rendered in white, the pedestrian way as people move up and down the streets and how important that is as a, you could move through the pop, straight, uh, pop space to connect Pine and Wall Street together becomes part of that connective uh, urban fabric and that we really imagine the pop space is this continuation of Hanover Street that wanders through the inside of the building and then back out to Pine Street. Across the way at Wall Street, you can see the, uh, the colonnade is rendered uh, just below and that the 55 and where it says 55 Wall Street is the great room in the Cipriani, which is a, is a, a private hall. There's a big contrast between this public space and the private hall that's across the way. And it is our idea to try to transform this facade so that it becomes much more engaging in the public way and that it allows the pedestrians to move from sidewalk into their room, which is uh, the community room here, which is the pub space. And that leads to the MTA. Next. 
Uh, a quick quick view of the inside today. There's an Egyptian aid uh, uh, celebration on the on the, the the pop space. It is the ceiling is brightly lit. It's very difficult to see uh, 55 Wall Street through this image. Um, our proposal, uh, if you go to the next image, is really to do a number of things. One is to create this wonderful uh, promenade or movement from Wall Street to Pine Street, but it is also to bring in a essentially a green park. Since we're limited on space, we've turned it vertically. We've cut a skylight up and brought a lot more light into the room. And we really see this space as commensurate with the sort of Parisian cafe experience where people sit and watch the theater of the street or the theater of people walking back and forth. Um, it's also maybe uh, akin to the Milan Galleria. So what we're really trying to do is make these two things come together and bring people together in a much more emphatic way. Next. What you see here is a comparative uh, the original 60 on the interior of that space looking out to uh, 55 Wall Street and our proposal. We've done two things. We've opened up the, the wall. We've made it a lot more transparent, the glass wall there. We thinned out the columns so that 55 plays a much more integrated role within the community room. We have also carved the ceiling back so that the facade can be much more expressed. So the integration between the presence of the outside and the inside are united. Next. Uh, this is a comparative series of slides. On the left is the uh, existing conditions of, uh, <coughs> of 60 Wall Street as you look from the north and the, or from the east and the west and are proposed right next to it on the right. And you can see how both facades look for the most part um, hold the same value in terms of holding the street edge. Um, the, uh, it all, always our intention was that it is very important to define the space of the street of Wall Street. If you go to the next slide, that perpendicular view, here you can see where the dramatic change happens. From the existing condition, you can barely see the pop space and our proposed really invites you in. Very important to the success and to the future of the space. Next. Uh, and then here you can see how all of those things come together. I think it's, it's important to note that for us, this, this transformation of, of more of a solid wall opening up, becoming an open opening into the space is very important. Next. Uh, Looking at the, the facade, uh, all the facades together, you see the, the vertical colonnade of the McKinley Mead White edition, uh, the stacking of the columns. It brought a, a vertical elegance uh, to the composition that the original 60 Wall Street doesn't have. We tried to bring that into the composition and to reinforce it with that second layer of uh, screening that reinforces the vertical, yet uh, weaves the horizontal. Next. Uh, the overall uh, datums within the project from the existing to the proposed remain exactly the same and have the same relationship to 55 as they always did. Next. And then looking at the detail of a particular bay, you can see the darkness of the back facade of the existing, and you can see how the 55 has a cadence between the front facade and the back wall and how we're trying to uh, pick up on that language. Next, there's this idea of the nesting of screens that I mentioned before. It exists in 55, as you see highlighted on the left. And the, our idea on the right is to take the screen, transform it into a smaller scale and repeat it so that we get this harmony or uh, this cadence within the facade. Next. And that results in uh, a series of columns that have a beautiful grandeur to them. They're sophisticated, they're elegant, they're representative of Wall Street, and they're supported by a, a back wall. As you move into, uh, next slide please, if you move into it or move around it, you start to see how the, uh, the, the, the wall opens up and invites you into that public space. Next. 
uh, looking at the columns as they are today. So a 60 wall uh, original columns are in the center. You can see how much bigger and heavier they are than the uh, 55 or are proposed on the right. If you go to the next slide, uh, one of the things we were very, very concerned with is how the base of the existing columns essentially isolates the colonnade space from the sidewalk. Those columns act as a significant barrier to the movement back and forth within the space. They kind of guard uh, the pop space and push people away, very much like the Piano Noble does at 55 Wall Street. We wanted to make this much more fluid. And if we go to the next image, you can see that we're uh, bringing those columns down to the ground. We're inviting people to use the uh, arcade uh, colonnade space, as well as a, as a kind of a flowing, consistent uh, ground plane that links with the, the sidewalk. Next. Um, and then in our proposal, how you're able to see all the way through uh, the, the pedestrian way to uh, Pine Street and how um, the existing condition really just focuses on the ceiling and it's hard to see the people uh, within the space that are occupying. Next. Looking at the materiality of the street, um, we see uh, after a careful study, how much of Wall Street is really composed of a a softer beige limestone uh, throughout the, the nature of the street. We chose to pick up on that materiality and that color choice to, uh, to define the new um, proposal for 60. Uh, it is a little bit uh, off of the color of the gray granite of 55, but the original uh, 60 Wall Street was of a rose granite. It didn't match uh, directly uh, either. But we think that our materiality is much more sympathetic to the overall streetscape that we see here. Next. Uh, looking closely, we're, uh, we're utilizing a Jura limestone, which is a wonderful limestone. It's going to have a variety of tooling that will give it a sophistication and depth and detail uh, within the facade that will make it quite, quite unusual and, and nice. Next. And you can see it here and how it animates the, the surface of the columns as it transforms, as it moves, as one moves around the column. Next. And then in this slide, we're going to begin to look at the relationship of the setting back of the, the street wall or the colonnade to the shaft of the tower. Uh, if you go to the, the next slide, you can see how this horizontal uh, nesting of screens starts to really pick up on the, the basic strip window of the shaft of the building and make for a, a natural transition there. And that the, the stepping back, uh, as I had mentioned before, of the existing and the proposed remains exactly the same. Next. Looking, uh, if, if you can try to imagine uh, bringing your head back and, and looking up the, the tower, you can see that the, in the existing uh, 60 Wall Street, what you really have is kind of a jumble of Egyptianate uh, motifs with the columns stacked on uh, uh, Hatshepsut's uh, kind of uh, cornice that's there. So it's really this kind of stacking or piling up of motifs in the, in the transition to the shaft. And then if you look at our uh, proposal, you see uh, this really this, this more simple, straightforward stacking of screens that make the transition to the, the shaft of the tower. Next. Um, and then lastly, kind of coming back, this phenomenal change as you move around the building being very important, that it holds the street wall, it, it uh, is an active player within the community, but then it opens up and becomes uh, a celebration of the pop space within. Next. And then uh, lastly, uh, what I would like to, to just say is that within the, <coughs> the context as a whole, I, I think the building integrates very well, um, but it allows the building to, to really work in the future 
uh, to really draw in uh, the population that is very important to this community and to allow uh, <coughs> 60 Wall Street to really play a bigger role in the public realm by exposing the pop space uh, to the space of the street. With that, I would like to return the uh, floor back to the chairman. Thank you very much. And thank you for the thoughtful presentation. Commissioners, do we have any questions at this time? Yes, Commissioner Goldblum, please go ahead. Yeah, I just want to get some of the ground rules clear just for my own, and I, I'm, I'm sure you said it already, but uh, uh, forgive me. We're looking at this not because the building in question is in, is in a historic district, not because the building itself is a historically designated building, but because the building in question was built pursuant to a determination that required a harmonious relationship between the sub subject building, 60 Wall Street, and the building across the street, 55, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yes. So we're really looking at the relationship of the modification as it affects the building as a whole's relationship to the landmark with special emphasis on the base you know, pursuant to our own habits of looking mostly at the base. Correct. Correct. Thank you, Correct. got it. And, and just to sort of follow that thought, the applicant presented at the beginning the specific findings that we made at the time, uh, the relationship between the existing design and 55 Wall Street. And so that those can, as this is an amendment to that report, those can be sort of the initial guiding factors as well as any other thoughts you have. Got it, thanks. Okay, other questions? Okay, I don't see any questions at this time. Why don't we move to public testimony and we may have more questions after that. So um, if you're in the meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. As always, we start with anyone who signed up in advance and then we get to everyone else. Um, but whether or not you signed up, please raise your hand so that we can find you in the, in the list of attendees. And I also want to note that we have received a number of uh, letters and testimony that were submitted in advance. And as always, all materials submitted to us have been shared with the commissioners. All right, and I will turn it over to uh, Sonia Gior to take us through the testimony. Great, thank you. So our first speaker will be Connor Allerton um, from Council Member Chris Marte's office. And you should be able to unmute your line, Connor. If you could please state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hi, yeah, this is Connor from, um, Connor Allerton from Council Member Christopher Marte's office. I'm presenting testimony on behalf of the council member, uh, the local council member for this application. Um, thank you, Chair Carroll and commissioners for allowing me to testify today. I urge you um, to reject this application for 60 Wall Street on the basis that the proposed alterations would no longer maintain a harmonious relationship with 55 Wall Street and would destroy the architectural significance of the existing facade and public atrium. Um, pursuant to section uh, 7479 of the zoning resolution, LPC's original approval of the development rights transfer from 55 Wall Street to 60 Wall was contingent on the harmonious relationship between the two architectures. The postmodern classical inspired design of the 60 Wall Street facade um, and atrium not only provides a beloved public space, but respectfully complements the Greek revival style of 55 Wall Street. Uh, the proposed alterations neither reflect the remaining architecture of 60 Wall Street nor provide any effort toward a harmonious relationship um, to its classical neighbor. Uh, the proposed piers and columns of the application uh, dilute the building's references to 55 Wall Street and strip away the creative and bold design uh, that makes this POPs uh, so unique. For these reasons, I urge the commission to reject the application uh, as it uh, in a way enhances or maintains the harmonious relationship between these two buildings. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Jason Friedman. And Jason, you should be able to unmute your line. So accept the request for panelist. Great. 
great. So that you're now a panelist, if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Jason Friedman from CB1, uh, chair of the Landmarks um, Committee. And we had a resolution here. I'll just read uh, a couple whereases. Um, the proposal fails to harmonize with the classical design of the colonnade row or any other 18th or 19th century styles and does little to elevate the standing of 55 Wall Street or 60 Wall Street, all occurring along the very historical landmark Wall Street corridor. Therefore, be it resolved that Community Board 1 Manhattan recommends that the Landmarks Preservation Commission reject the proposal because it is not harmonious, nor does it improve on the findings of the special permit or improve upon the design characteristics outlined in the 1980s Landmarks Report. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker will be Roger Byram. And Roger, you should be able to unmute your line. If you could please state yes. your name for the record, you have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Um, I'm Roger Byram, a former chair of the Landmarks Committee at CB1 for 20 years. Uh, my uh, office is actually next door to 60 Wall Street. We're in 48 Wall Street. So I'm very, very familiar with um, <clears throat> the proposal. Um, the special permit was issued uh, to allow for a very large bonus to, to the development. And it seems to me that it's very important that the commissioners really focus on what that special permit required. And the special permit required has been, has been clarified by Mark in that it, the base, uh, the columns of 60 wall must be and should be harmonious with 55 wall. And as we've explained to Hugh and the applicant uh, a number of times at Community Board One, the proposal completely destroys that harmonious, harmonious nature. Um, we understand the, the struggle for light in pops, but we believe there's other ways to achieve that than destroying what the LPC um, uh, honored when it gave that special permit to 60 Wall Street. So for those reasons, I think as the commissioners have said, that's what you need to focus on. And that's why we would strongly recommend that you reject this application as presented. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Andrea Goldman. Andrea, okay. You should, okay, if you could just state okay. your name for the record, you have three minutes to speak. Great, thanks, Sonia. Uh, good day, Chair Carol. Good morning, Chair Carol and Commissioners. I'm Andrea Goldwyn speaking on behalf of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. The Conservancy has a particular interest in this proposal, the easement that Mark mentioned we hold on 55 Wall Street. It was established as part of the continuing maintenance agreement outlined in LPC's report to the City Planning Commission supporting the transfer of development rights from 55 to 60 wall, along with the favorable comments on the original harmonious relationship between the landmark and the design of its new neighbor. The relationship between 55 and 60 is a textbook example of harmoniousness, and we cannot support this application, which would diminish it. Walking down Wall Street, there's a clear visual connection between the heavy colonnade at the base of 55 wall and the row of robust, well-articulated columns at 60 wall. The proposal to replace them with minimal slender columns would remove the most significant aspect of the harmonious relationship. In recent years, the commission has heard several applications considering the harmonious relationship, usually of a low rise landmark and a new towering neighbor. Our comments have often questioned how the two buildings, which have no relationship, can be harmonious. But here, we ask you to respect the existing harmonious relationship and reject the proposal. Unlike most preservation statutes, New York's Landmarks Law gives us the opportunity to consider the historic character of buildings just 30 years old. And certainly, it can be an interesting exercise to consider buildings that one might remember from their opening to now be historic. Roshan Dinkaloo's 60 Wall Street is a complete example of picturesque, flamboyant postmodernism. Instead of these proposed changes, this building merits evaluation by the commission for designation. We hope that the owners will recognize that this design is a unique asset, perfect for our Instagram age, and it should be celebrated. Thank you for the opportunity to express the Conservancy's views. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Alice Blank. 
And Alice, I'll be promoting you to panelists now. And you should be able to unmute your line. If you could please state your name for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Alice, are you able to unmute your line? Sorry, thank Great. you. Good morning, Chair Carroll and Commissioners. My name is Alice Blank. I'm Vice Chair of Manhattan Community Board One, which has provided a resolution in opposition to the proposed alterations to 60 Wall Street. Today, I am testifying as an architect who strongly supports the Community Board's resolution and believes the proposed alterations to 60 Wall Street in no way meet the criteria of the required harmonious relationship with its neighbor at 55 Wall Street. The applicant's presentation to this board stating an alleged need for better access and visibility from the street is specious as any visit to the site will confirm. In fact, Roshan Dinkaloo's 60 Wall Street is a brilliant interpretation of the Greek classicist building across the street at 55 Wall Street, and as such is a singularly successful example of a harmonious relationship as confirmed by this commission twice previously in 1984 and 1986. As architecture critic Paul Goldberger remarked upon the building's completion, like its distinguished older neighbors, this building pays attention to the street. It's not a piece of sculpture plopped down on an open space, but a building designed to strengthen the fabric of the street of which it is a part. On Wall Street, there is a strong granite base echoing in abstracted form the columned facade of the old Citibank City headquarters, 55 Wall Street, right across the street. Now the applicant's proposal offers an uninspired sterile design that would alter the strong granite base and directly com compromise the harmonious relationships that defines both the character of the street and the design of the, itself of this iconic postmodernist tower. Today in New York, where concerns about sustainability are paramount, our city agencies should be vigilant in the review of any proposed alteration and demolition that is unnecessary and is here ill-conceived. Rather than approve the demolition and reconstruction of a significant portion of 60 Wall Street, this commission would serve the public far better by designating 60 Wall Street as a New York City landmark, one of the few postmodernist buildings ever to be so designated, and by encouraging the applicant to provide the requisite preservation 60 Wall well deserves. Lastly, with regard to the city's review process, we should all be quite concerned that the proposed alterations to 60 Wall Street are being reviewed by different commissions, at different times. The Landmark Preservation Commission is asked today to review the proposed facade and public arcade changes in the context of the harmonious relationship requirements, while the City Planning Commission will be asked next month to review the proposed changes to the arcade and the 15,880 square foot beloved by many interior pops. The LPC must take great care that your decision here today does not influence the public and the city planning commission's subsequent review of the same plans of the same area. I urge the LPC to oppose this application and I thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker will be Helen Freeman. And Helen, I'll be promoting you to panelists now. And you should be able to unmute your line. If you could please state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hello, my name is Helen Freeman from Historic Districts Council. Historic Districts Council does not find the proposed alterations to the facade of 60 Wall Street to be in keeping with the harmonious relationship to 55 Wall Street. As called out in the original Landmarks report, the commission found a harmonious relationship specifically calling out among other things, the height, rhythm and massing of the first floor colonnade. We do not find that the current proposal is acceptable in maintaining those elements in relation to 55 wall. The new columns are articulated as thin vertical piers. The base loses its rhythm and massing and becomes instead too flat and abstracted to relate to 55 wall. We do not agree with the applicant's assertion that the design is a basic form of the colonnade, is not a duplicate of 55 wall, but contemporary and a sensitive response. To HDC, it seems to bear little con connection to 55 Wall Street, but rather evokes a standard contemporary corporate design as can be seen by any number of large corporate skyscrapers across the city. 
the existing exterior columns at the base and the exterior details up to the fifth floor would all be largely erased with the proposed design changes, eliminating the very important harmonious connection, which includes a strong visual connection of the columns at multiple scales between both structures. The change at the base of 60 wall now removes the overall consistency of the building, making it look like it is two buildings. Therefore, it loses the harmonious relationship, not just with 55 Wall Street, but with itself as a cohesive architectural design. A small note on the visibility of the landmark at 55 Wall Street. The applicant claims that the new glass entrance to the POPs will provide more visibility of the landmark, but in numerous renderings, they include hanging greenery that would block views of 55 Wall Street, making this unlikely. Finally, in addition to our comments on the harmonious relationship, we believe this building is a deserving candidate for exterior and interior designation. It is a very significant example of postmodern design in New York City and is widely seen as one of the best examples of the period. As such, we strongly discourage the commissioners from allowing any modifications which would compromise the building's architectural integrity. We urge the LPC staff to consider the designation of this site in the interim. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Liz Wakus. And Liz, I'll be promoting you to panelists now. And Liz, you should be able to unmute your line. Uh, if you could please state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. There we go. Um, good morning, Chair Carroll and Commissioners. Um, I'm Liz Waitakis, uh, Executive Director of Jokomoma US. During the last few years, Jokomoma US has been focusing more of its resources on postmodernism and the design of the recent past. As significant examples are increasingly threatened due to lack of appreciation and understanding and research. Our organization is now in a position where we believe 60 Wall Street is worthy of historic designation and we are pleased the commission has an opportunity to comment on the proposed changes through a harmonious relationship report with its neighbor at 55 Wall Street. Docomoma US does not find the proposed alterations to the facade are in keeping with the harmonious relationship. We do not find the thin vertical piers proposed at the base will maintain this relationship nor do we find the blended facade articulation from the base up to the fifth floor to have a meaningful relationship to the stacked facade of 55 wall. The horizontal division of the two stages of design are perhaps just as important as the colonnades. The current design articulates this in a masterful way where the proposal does not. The existing double chamfered columns that line the base of 60 Wall Street also do an excellent job maintaining the street wall and its relationship on one of New York City's most important and historic streets. We also find it alarming that the, proposed, the proposal seeks to alter only the lower level of the facade by alternating the base and not the tower. The new design would not be harmonious with 55 wall and it would not be harmonious with itself. We find these proposed changes to be unnecessary. We believe they would negatively impact the entire length of Wall Street, disrupting the visual bridge so carefully considered by the Roche office. We urge the commission to deny the proposal. Jokomomo US would also like to encourage the commission to consider the exterior and interior designations submitted by our organization for 60 Wall Street. The 30 year requirement of the landmarks law gives us all a unique opportunity to consider more designs of the recent past. While some may have considered postmodernism to be unattractive just a few years ago, we should all take pride in the fact that Midtown now boasts landmarks such as the Ambassador Grill and the AT&T building. Seeing postmodernism or in fact seeing any architectural style sometimes takes a fresh set of eyes and a bit of time as tastes change and as we are able to consider a building's cultural and historical significance more constructively. Jokomomo US does not believe there is a flood of postmodern designations. However, 60 Wall Street is one of these important examples that still must be recognized. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, our next speaker will be Josh Nakowitz, and I'll be promoting you to panelists now. And you should be able to unmute your line. If you could please state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Good morning. My name is Josh Nakowitz. I am testifying on behalf of the Alliance for Downtown New York. I am the Alliance's Senior Vice President for Economic Development and Planning. Um, the Alliance is testifying this morning in strong support for 60 Wall Street's application to upgrade uh, the property's lower facade. We firmly believe the proposed modifications are consistent with the character of the area, in addition to enhancing the pedestrian experience along one of Lower Manhattan's most visited corridors and preserving the economic vitality of New York City's second largest central business district. Uh, as we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a devastating impact on Lower Manhattan. Nearly 22% of our bid's 90 million square feet of office space was vacant as of the first quarter of 2022. Vacant office space has a tremendous impact on the viability of a neighborhood, which has long been one of the most important drivers of economic activity for all New Yorkers. With over 1.6 million square feet of space, 60 Wall is by far the largest office building on Wall Street. Filling this space is critical to Lower Manhattan's long-term recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. Unfortunately, 60 Wall's outdated and fortress-like facade presents real challenges to the building's commercial viability. The existing facade is uninviting and doesn't allow an active and vibrant pedestrian experience along Wall Street. The proposed modifications to the building's facade creatively use columns, materials, and screening elements to maintain a harmonious relationship with the landmark 55 wall, while greatly improving the pedestrian experience and creating a more inviting entrance for future tenants. On behalf of our board of directors at the Alliance for Downtown New York, we strongly urge the commission to support 60 Wall's thoughtful and reasonable design proposal within all applicable rules and regulations. And thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Christina Conroy. Christina, I'll be promoting you to panelists now. And you should be able to unmute your line. If you could please state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Okay, uh, good morning, <clears throat> commissioners. I'm Christina Conroy for the Victorian Society in New York. <clears throat> Founded in New York City in 1966, the Victorian Society in America is dedicated to fostering the appreciation and preservation of our 19th and early 20th century heritage. The New York chapter promotes preservation of our historic districts, individual landmarks, interiors, and civic art. Now we comment on this proposal because it raises a host of issues, including the harmonious relationship between 60 Wall and the Victorian era exchange building across the street in number 55. There is nothing in section 74 to 79 of the zoning resolution that states or implies that the required findings for a harmonious architectural relationship expire or can be changed at will. 60 Wall Street exists because particular findings of a harmonious relationship were made at a particular point in time. We believe its designation is tied irrevocably to the original 74 to 79 approval. If the design changes, the transfer of developmental rights should be null and void. Now, we also have a fondness for the postmodern design movement as an effort, flawed and aborted though it was, to reconnect with the long tradition of Western architecture. We believe 60 Wall is a significant and successful example of postmodern design. It is harmonious with and indeed enhances the historic character of Wall Street, especially 55 Wall. The proposed redesigned tower seems like a throwback to 1960s modernism, modernism, whose features of the existing building cited in the original approval as contributing to the harmonious relationship with 55 Wall Street are gone, replaced by features with no such relationship. The applicant claims that the relationship is enhanced in the proposed design because a better view of the landmark from inside 60 Walls lobby. Now, this focus on viewing the landmark is a trope equivalent to the idea of a reflective reflective glass facade being just the thing adjacent to a historic building because it reflects the historic facade. Now, both concepts demonstrate a lack of understanding of what harmony means in the context of the architecture of cities. Now, finally, commissioners, projects such as this show us just how shallow the concept of sustainability is to the real estate community. Thank you. Thank you. 
And so those are all of the speakers who signed up in advance. And as a reminder, we do always have our speakers signed up in advance to speak first. So now we'll move to anyone else who has raised their hand. And we do have one hand raised. Um, I could please, I'll unmute your line. And if you could please set your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Confirm that you can hear me, please. Yes, we can hear you. Good afternoon. This is Theodore Grunewald. Today's applicant gives the game away when, on page 51 of their presentation, they state that 60 Wall's outdated postmodern design is no longer a contemporary response, close quote. Commissioners know that we have heard this rubric many, many times before. Much of the world's great Victorian and Gothic revival architecture fell to the wrecking ball when early 20th century tastes changed to classical revivalism and later modernism. In the post-war period, it wasn't until the 1960s that Beaux-Arts and later in the 1970s, Art Deco architecture was taken seriously enough to merit historic preservation. With postmodernism, so the pendulum of taste swings back again, from ridicule to reappraisal and reappreciation, as the wrecking ball is, yet again, poised to strike. Beginning in 2016, this commission first recognized the importance of the postmodern movement by designating Alan Greenberg's facade alterations to Bergdorf Goodman, followed a year later in 2017 with the first interior landmark designation of a postmodern space, that is Kevin Roche's uh, lovely uh, UN Plaza Hotel lobby, together with his late modern Ambassador Grill. Finally, in 2018, the Commission designated the exterior of Philip Johnson's AT&T building. In evaluating today's application, it's important to note that while it's not a designated landmark, 60 Wall Street is one of New York City's most coherent and accomplished skyscrapers of the postmodern era. Truly reflective of its time, 60 Wall merits evaluation and protection as an officially designated New York City landmark, as does its beautifully detailed and meticulously crafted public atrium. And I urge commissioners to study the two separate requests for evaluation submitted by Docomomo USA, one for the exterior and a second RFE submitted for its floor area bonus uh, POPs atrium. It's, notice, it's notable that Kevin Roche Jean Dinkaloo's postmodern columnar vocabulary at 60 Wall, with its tripart composition of base, shaft, and faceted capital, so expressive and essential to the uh, landmark number 55 across the way, was first originated by the architects at the Central Park Zoo, where the columns are composed of brick with faceted gra granite bases and capitals. The same abstracted classical columns appeared again, this time in mirror glass and green marble at the UN Plaza Hotel lobby, and were deployed yet again at Roche's former E.F. Hutton building on West 53rd Street opposite MoMA. Sadly, E.F. Hutton's magnificent lobby with its breathtaking high postal hall has been completely destroyed, renovated out of existence in a bland, middle-brow minimalist style by MDEAS architects, the same architects who destroyed Raymond Hood's McGraw-Hill building lobby. And this should serve as an object lesson and baleful example of what should not be permitted to happen at 60 Wall under any circumstances. In conclusion, the Commission has a unique mandate to defend the public's interests by preserving the full and complete architectural integrity of 60 Wall Street because the E.F. Hutton building is no longer recognizable as a work by Roche Dinkaloo, and most especially because in 1983-84, the public gave 60 Wall Street 365 thousand additional square feet of space in the form of air rights acquired from 55 wall across the way Excuse and me, Mr. an additional three minutes if you could please and, your I, i'm just gonna i'm gonna read up the last sentence okay, okay. and an additional 160,000 square feet floor area bonus for the indoor public atrium thus contributing to the bu the building's aggregate total of 1 million 600,000 square feet. Please deny the application and act in the public interest today to calendar 60 Wall Street's exterior and interior atrium for individual landmark designation without delay. Thank you. Thank you. So we do not have any other hands raised or any other speakers signed up, so I'll turn it back to you, Chair Carroll. 
Great, thank you very much. And I just do want to recognize that Docomomo did submit RFEs for the interior and exterior. Those are currently under review, um, but we are currently looking at an application to modify the exterior. And so we will focus our comments on that and we'll um, have a discussion today that may not result in an action, but I think we should uh, continue to have a uh, discussion as the applicants are here and have presented some arguments to us. And so with that, I'd like to turn it back to the applicants to ask if you'd like to respond to the testimony. I think if I, if I could just say a few things and then Hugh, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Um, you know, the harmonious relationship is a tricky thing. It is looking at a situation where you have a project that has it's going to be bigger than a landmark. It's, it's acquiring development rights. It's going to be built um, at, in its time. Um, what we are looked at and thought about from the applicant standpoint is how to make a building work within its context, work as a neighbor, uh, work uh, from a, a programmatic and an operational standpoint. Uh, the design that Hugh has done maintains the rhythm, the spacing of the columns maintains the tripartite design. It creates, um, it changes the materiality, but creates a strong street wall and a strong you know, stone presence, which we do feel is um, harmonious. And I think the question in my mind and you know, in what we're looking at is an opportunity to keep a building and to create a building that will be um, a contributor to the lower Manhattan in a way that we think is attractive at the street front and also attractive from an operational standpoint. Um, uh, many of the comments, you know, we're talking about the, a potential designation or a more harmonious relationship or the relationship between sort of a postmodern Italianate style versus a more classical, you know, a differently classical style. And I'm, you know, I, I I, I would hope that you know you could talk about those relationships because creating sort of a modern colonnade in our view is a consistent and an appropriate and a harmonious response to what exists today. So I will uh, turn turn it over to Hugh. Yeah, I, I will. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, you know, we were challenged with. Uh, repositioning the building to really set it up for the next 50 years and to uh, create a, an inviting environment for uh, not only the tenants, but for the public to um, really interact with the building. Um, it, it was deemed that we needed to, to develop a harmonious relationship with 55. And what the meaning and intent of harmonious is a bit abstract in its nature, just in general, uh, and it's up to interpretation. It's up to you commissioners to decide that. However, we, um, we look at a Beaux-Arts building that used Beaux-Arts architecture to respond to its additions and its movement and its uh, development in time. We look at a postmodern building that responded to the 80s we are repositioning a building in 22, looking to the next 50 years. We have uh, you know, a belief that looking at the heart of the architecture in 55, that there is something deeper down in the essence of its construction that has to do with a series of screens that are both stacked and nested within each other that reveal the interior of the architecture and the spaces within. We strongly believe that what we're incorporating is a design that holds the street wall in an elegant and sophisticated way that uh, responds to a strong civic presence that Wall Street is all about. And that transforms this building to allow the public to interact with it in a much more convincing way than it does today. The building today is a defense bank type fortress, as was 55 across the way. 
we want to invite the people in so that the public realm is much more active uh, for the whole nature of Wall Street. I'll hand the table back to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I just wanted to um, note, as I said earlier, that we did receive a number of letters and, and written testimony in advance of the hearing that were shared with the commissioners. And I'll just ask Sonia to give us the number and, and briefly summarize that. Yes, so there were 10 letters received. Um, some of them were from organizations who spoke today, and the rest were from members of the public. Okay. And those, as, as I said, have been shared with the commission. All right, commissioners, any final questions for the applicant? I actually just had one question on um, Wall Street at the where the hops entrance is, you have a double layer of columns. On Pine Street, there's only a single layer of columns and the glass is more forward. And um, I wondered if Pine Street, by having a single layer of columns and the, a glass wall more forward and plain, if that was more successful than wall, it may not be because Pine in general is a, is a less active street, but did you have thoughts on that? Well, um, what, what you described is, and when you say double, it's a little bit confusing with our building because there's two, two pair on two pair in right. the original. And when you're, I think you're talking about one behind the other, yes. right? In, in, right? In terms of moving into the building. So I'm going to clarify that as you talk about it. Um, in, on the Wall Street facade, it is a continuously exposed double reading of the columns. On Pine Street, there are there is a moment in which that double wall is is expressed, and that is on entry to the pop space. So you do get a kind of a fragmented moment of that. The rest of the facade, as as you know, it's essentially a mirror of the Wall Street compressed in space, but it does open up just that that much at the pop space. So you are seeing that the double layer happen. I think that. Um, the, the idea of moving through uh, on, on Pine Street as well as uh, Wall Street is uh, very sympathetic to um, the, the kind of overall flow. And I do think it, it, it helps to provide a balance even though compressed in space. Okay, thank you. All right, commissioners, any final questions? I'm sending you all requests to unmute so that we can begin our discussion. So if you can accept those. All right, Commissioner Chapin, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? So second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, so we'll begin our discussion now. And as um, has been presented, this is an amendment to our original report that supported the 7479 to transfer development rights and in doing so finding a harmonious relationship between number 60 and number 55 from which the development rights were being taken. Um, and that was largely found to be in the base. And um, as was presented, we had findings that the um, relationship was created by the materiality, the rhythm and height and spacing of the columns, um, among other factors. So I think that as this is an amendment, as I said earlier, that's a good starting point. And you may have other thoughts as well. I think the question of something having more of a harmonious relationship than something else is something that you might have in your mind as well, since there's an existing condition that was previously approved by the commission. And, um, and finally, with respect to requests for the commission to evaluate the uh, merit of the buildings, if it, you know, that is under review, but if you feel that these buildings do, this building does uh, merit designation, you may not be as comfortable making uh, suggestions for or, or comments on a proposed change, or you may find that there are some changes that would uh, enhance the POPs, but would not uh, detract from the, mer you know, the, the, the um, merit of the 
building. So that may be another way that you're thinking about it. And that was sort of, I think, um, why I asked that question about whether there were um, simpler changes that might be, might achieve some of the goals that would preserve, um, that, you know, the front colonnade and maybe allow for some change at the back wall to uh, open, increase visibility. So I think that there are a variety of ways that your thoughts could go um, on this. And so I would encourage you all to give comments today so that the applicants have some real direction um, on where they're going before they embark on their city planning process. So we'll begin that discussion now. Um, Commissioner Shamir Baron, would you like to start this one? Sure, thank you. Uh, this is, um, it's interesting to see this um, today at, on the same day when, you know, we were seeing the Cambria Heights Queens project um, because it, it, it points to, uh, you know, the, di the difficult conversations and thinking around styles that are um, sort of lesser, greater, more valued, less valued, what, what something, you know, what the kind of age of a certain style, despite the fact that it may not have um, crossed over into a kind of a level of appreciation or of, um, you know, pr preservation thinking, uh, whether it warrants, um, whether it warrants a kind of <coughs> and the same strategies um, of preservation. But let's just put that aside for a moment because uh, the, the first issue is this question of harmonious relationship, which is problematic in and of itself, I think, but I have, we have to accept it as a, as, a, as, a, as a method of transferring rights and allowing for development. So um, I, I do think that uh, it, there's, you know, like appropriateness, harmonious, a har harmonious relationship, as you say, can, is, is a spectrum and can, in given cases, be defined and interpreted in, in various ways, which is to say that things can be, as we've discussed before, more appropriate and less appropriate, but appropriate nonetheless. And I think similarly, uh, the question, you know, harmony or, har or harmonious relationship can be more or less or multi, um, you know, varied in, in a way. Um, so it, so the first question is, is in my mind is, is this new proposal um, harmonious with the um, 55 building? And, and how, would I have imagined, would I, you know, if this were coming to us in the first place in that, with that same question, would I have found it harmonious? And I have to say sort of, Harmonious enough. I mean, it seems to me that um, the the aspect of harmonious relationship is also, you know, whether it's a to, to make sure that it is not egregiously um, negative in its impact on the historic build on the you know the historic building that we're trying to protect, especially given the kind of the proximity and the tightness of of these streets and 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 their you know the fact that they really impact one upon the other. So I think it's it, I think it is relatively harmonious enough. Although I can't, and, and I accept the architects and the presenters, pr pr um, the applicants, um, you know, sets of, of ways in which they have attempted to strike that, that harmony with uh, the, the various screens and the various levels and all of that. It's, it's harmonious enough. Uh, so, but, but does that warrant, I have to switch now back to the other issue, which is does that warrant the demolition of and and removal of a previously harmonious, elite, you know, ag agreed upon or accepted, approved building, and one which, I mean, of course, there's like all kinds of ironies here because the postmodern movement rejected, existed to reject modernism, especially international style, the very elements of which the, this applicant is presenting to us as as the kind of the ideal next step for this location and for its usability and for its um, and for public access, you know, thin elements, transparencies, um, uh, overlaying of you know of of light and uh, the ability to see across and through to other settings. So, you know, the the irony of replacing one with the other is is 
is, is aggravated by the fact that the aspect of its harmoniousness that is 60s with the 55 is, is, is so much part of what became the kind of the tenets of the postmodern movement, meaning this kind of re direct relationship, <laughs> kind of a, almost a, um, a pedantic, I mean, like a, a direct relationship and conversation with the historic artifact. Mm -hmm. And that, and so in this sense, 60 as it exists today is like a textbook case for the ex an example of what the postmodern movement is and was. I voted against uh, the changes to, to the at t Bill 550 Madison because I thought that, the ask, that while I'm not a great proponent of postmodernism, I thought that it, that it needed to be um, respected. Uh, you know, the, the, what, the, the darkness of the entry, the double, the double piers, the, the, the weight of that building, the kind of the gloominess of that building um, is needed to be um, maintained. And, and I think I was among the only one, maybe the only one who voted against the changes to that building. So I have to ask myself the question of like where I am here on this. I'm, I know I'm, I'm going on and on, but I will say one thing. I find it to be a, a, a problematic. I accept the fact that the new proposal might be um, have an aspect of harmonious relationship to the 55 building. I don't know that that warrants or it makes reasonable the removal of this other building, which was in a sense a textbook case for a style, a style which had a sense of place as per Cambria and a style that developed its own kind of bottom te fundamental tenets in in this conversation with the historic but I would say that if there if we all agreed that there could be something that could happen here I could imagine that the existing building the existing postmodern building by Rosendinkaloo could be modified in that the glass face beyond in front you know sort of closer to the building from to the columns could become more transparent could become more glazed and while retaining the existing columns, meaning that you could actually see more reflectivity, you know, have more, more reflected of the of 55 in it. And also that, that, that there might be more of a, of a public um, direct engagement with the street. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Robert. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, we'll go to Commissioner Chapin next. Thank you, sir. Uh, obviously, the applicant is competing with an outstanding original existing solution by Rosh Dinkolo, which uh, was so well done at the time that the uh, individual, an individual designation of the exterior and, and the interior does not seem inappropriate. Uh, I'm going to focus, uh, however, on uh, things that I think really uh, severely disrupt the harmoni harmonious uh, relationship that I think currently exists, because uh, it, it could be that something could be presented to us that was approvable in the absence of such a designation. So I find that the nesting screens and the fins call attention uh, to themselves as a screen, that they, they really don't work in the way the applicant did had hoped perhaps. I think that removing the architrave and the cornice and lengthening the columns really completely changes the proportions of the base and its classicism. I, I also feel that the entrance loses its distinctive monumental character. The entrance no longer, you know, appears as a real, as a strong presenting entrance. And it kind of fades into the screen, in my opinion, the way the screen, the current entrance is constructed. I think also that the columns are so simplified, they're just posts. They, they do not have a classical reference or reference to uh, 55 in any way. So I think the problem is that the design itself, really uh, the elements of it uh, do not, uh, create a harmonious relationship with 55 wall um, and uh, presented side to side with the current one, which does have a harmonious relationship. It is even more obvious. So I'm focusing on the things that change from one to the other uh, because 
uh, they they all I think diminish the harmonious relationship. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Commissioner Goldblum. Thank you. This is a, a very interesting application uh, for me, anyway. Um, the building is not currently protected by landmarks preservation. Uh, it's not a designated landmark. It's not part of a designated district. Therefore, the removal of the material at the base, in my view, is something that the applicant has every right to do. Um, furthermore, since the design is not, um, you know, a designated design, changing that design to uh, another aesthetic is also, you know, totally within their rights to consider and within our rights to consider it accepting. Um, this is an interesting application because it's really throwing out the architecture of the building above it and proposing that a new architecture uh, that is very different in its uh, design pre uh, elements, in its style, uh, from the building uh, that it is the base of. Um, that's furthermore, that's a further challenge to our considerations because even though it is our habit to focus on the base when thinking about that ambiguous word, harmonious, relate, harmonious, um, it, it is not a, it's not written into the law and it is not, um, uh, it, it, it's, it's a matter of practice as opposed to, to, to law or, or rule. Um, so is it, you know, what is the nature of the, of the evaluation of harmoniousness when the object in question is itself a little bit schizophrenic, right? You have a base that's one thing and a tower that's another. Um, all of these questions are raised by this application. So I think that it's acceptable to totally demolish the base. I think that they need not keep the columns or anything you know, that they don't have to keep for, for structural or other reasons. However, I think that the imposition of a kind of chipper fieldian uh, uh, neoclassicism with it, you know, which this very clearly is, which has zero relationship to, to the building above or to the building that is seeking the, the, the harmony, I think is a, a tough sell. Um, I'm not particularly a fan of the Roach Dinkloo building. Uh, um, so I don't, I don't feel compelled to say that they must save one element or another. However, their job is to create a conversation or a harmonious relationship between this building that's across the street from them. Um, and that is done classically uh, by thinking about by having the two buildings kind of have a visual dialogue. Um, that visual dialogue need not be ionic, fluted columns over rusticated bases, but it, it should have elements that when you're looking at this view or other views, one senses a relationship between building A and building B. And I don't think that I particularly get that apart from the materiality of it. Um, their argument was not that this design related to the 55 wall building particularly well. It just, they, their argument was that it relates no worse than, than the old one. Did. And they showed guidelines, you know, you know, proportions that were meant to show not that the buildings related to the building related to 55, but related to the predecessor at 60. So, I mean, I, I personally don't, think that this design talks to 55 particularly effectively, doesn't engage it in a conversation or create harmony with it, which I would, you know, understand to mean a kind of aesthetic relationship of some kind. It could be proportions, it could be uh, details, it could be any number of things, but this ain't it. That's point one. Point two, I don't think it's, I personally, have a different view of the, the term harmonious than, than is what 
we normally, uh, as a commission, have in the past uh, acted on, which is that I don't think you can separate a base from a tower. I don't think you can look at just the bottom or just the left or just the right. I think you have to look at the building, just like we look at buildings in other contexts. So here we have a very tall, very charismatic, very you know designed building, and to have the base have little to no relationship with that upper structure to basically say, I'm kind of embarrassed about the upper structure. I don't really like the upper structure, but I don't have the budget to replat it stem to stern. So I'm just gonna mess with the base. I think that's bad urbanism. And I think it's bad from, a, you know, I don't think how that too can, re can create harmony. You know, if, if the upper is related to the lower in an integral aesthetic fashion, even if you change the design completely, I think that you will have harmony as an urban ensemble, uh, much more so than you do now where it, it looks like what it is, which is a, a rehab of the bottom few floors. Okay, that's great, thank you. Commissioner Devonshire. Thanks, Sarah. Um... Boy, this one really is a struggle. And I, I think I'm gonna be uh, struggling with this one probably until the day that I die. Um, I, I, ultimately, my thoughts about it are that it, it is not harmonious enough. It's not harmonious as much as the extant facade of the Rostinkalu building is the, um, I think Adi hit, hit it on the head, you know, Harmony ha has a, a very broad spectrum. There's, there's Beethoven and there's Harry Parch and, and you come up with, with different levels of, of harmoniousness um, in your struggles in defining and understanding what these terms are and for us at this point, uh, um, it, it has to be visual. I mean, I, I understand all the issues about having to have workspace, blah, blah, blah. And I, I actually think that what they've done to the pop space inside is um, admirable. However, I also, although I am not a proponent of, at, at all of postmodernism, I think that this is an important postmodernist building. And I'll just leave that there because if, if we were entertaining uh, designating it today, I would, I would be on the side of designation. So, so again, I, I go back to kind of what Adi said. My, my first take on this, I, I looked at this image and I just thought, my God, it's, um, it's, actually almost as scrawny as the uh, as the uh, Carré d'Arc in Nîmes that was constructed across from the Maison Carré by Norman Foster. And it's just a, a scrawny being um, that is supposedly has a harmonious relationship with the Maison Carré. And, and in my opinion, it does not. So where I come down is that this, this colonnade is absolutely uh, disharmonious to 55. If they could somehow reconfigure what's going on with the, the glazing behind it to give them the light that they need to, to enhance the supposedly new office space, uh, blah, 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 I would... I would be in favor of that, but this doesn't do it for me. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chen. Yeah, uh, very interesting case. And uh, you know, the commissioners have made uh, excellent comments. I, I think uh, the two Michaels pointed out as well as uh, Diana Chapin uh, and, and Adi, the, the issue of harmonious coexistence, uh, the need for dialogue given that 55 wall is the landmark building. It is a very strong pattern of the classical, you know, ionic columns across the street. And I think that 
in trying to attempt, the applicant in trying to achieve a lighter interior, which uh, Commissioner Devonshire just alluded to. Um, I think they succeeded on the inside, but I think they went too far on the exterior in trying to make this rhythm of columns or patterns um, on the street a little bit too slender and too thin that to a point of in trying to achieve the, uh, the, the objective of light and air going inside, uh, it rendered the, 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 um, the, uh, the, the original design uh, by Kevin uh, and, and Dingalo uh, design to, uh, to, uh, to, a, to a different level. So I, I, I would suggest that uh, follow other commissioners' suggestion that the applicant really should study and restudy the proportions because there's a strong dialogue, at least on the base. I mean, uh, Wall Street area, as you know, is very few people look up. Um, that, that often when you're in a hurry. Um, but uh, there is clearly a very strong need for a, 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 a communication on both sides of the street, uh, whether you have a pattern of A and B or, or B and not that, that uh, you have to follow the classical columns. Uh, but you know, on the other side is, is a different, different, but the rhythm, there could be a rhythm there. And so I, I leave it as that. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lutfi. Thank you. I, I also want to um, say that I think my colleagues have all made really interesting and important observations uh, about the architecture itself, about the context that uh, it's within, um, and about, you know, the original intent. And I'm going to draw a little bit from everybody and add a couple of things. I wanna step back for a minute and just go back to what the applicant is trying to achieve. And, and I have to say that I am someone who's, who worked for quite a while in economic development. I'm uh, completely sympathetic to the goals of this project. And I, I think that they're important to the vitality of the city, which is something that we have to take into consideration when we are looking at uh, these projects. Um, Lower Manhattan has come a long way um, in terms of its uh, economic vitality, not only as a, an a business district, but as a mixed use environment where people work and live and it's taken some time. And I, I think it's important uh, given the current state of uh, the commercial market in New York um, to take this seriously when we're looking at these projects because all that has been layered on here and built, I think we want to try to maintain. I mean, the move to Midtown is, I think, from a very important financial services firm is, is something for everyone to think about because there's, there's a shift in the, in the, uh, finan the, in the uh, economic base of this city. And, um, you know, we're industry wise. And I think we wanna try to, we wanna be able to both maintain the core of what the strength of this district has been and also attract uh, new industries. And many of the new industries are moving to different kinds of places. So in and of itself, um, the the goals behind this this uh, the applicants' efforts I think are important, and I do agree. Um, and I think Addie mentioned it first. I mean, it you know, if you were to look at this just in a vacuum, if this was new construction in this area, and it was a very coherent architectural piece, I think we might, or I would feel that there 
there is a connection between 55 and 60, and there is a rhythm. And even in this particular view, as I'm looking at it, and it might look as though these columns are slim, and they are slim from a perspective, uh, but they are they are they actually do have some heft, and I feel like there is a rhythm here that that works, and I think this this desire to make sure that space how spaces built in not only office buildings but other buildings culture residential etc how they hit the ground these days in particular is very very important and so the idea of having something that is porous and a little more light filled and potentially animated um, is is a worthy goal um, and one that I support. That said, uh, as my colleagues have also mentioned, I don't think that the base of this building speaks to the rest of the building successfully. And so I, I and I, I can't just say that, you know, this works because it works at the base, doesn't work together. And I have to join, you know, my other colleagues in saying that I'm not like the biggest fan of, um, of postmodernism, but this is the building that we have right now. And um, I think that the applicant has to go back and look at the build at this piece of architecture as a whole and make sure that its response speaks to what is above it. And then I think as part of doing that, and you know, maybe they need to move the, the glazing forward, maybe something happens a little bit with the mountains um, at the base, there's lighting, there's, there's many things that can be done. This isn't a, the, the actual inside of the, of the ground floor space isn't really a dark space. What's, what's dark in general is how narrow these streets are. Um, and uh, so I think that uh, the, the, the architect has to you know, think a little bit more out of the box and tweak the design so that it is more integrated with, with what's there and still speaks to uh, 55. Thank you. Commissioner Jefferson. Um, interesting discussion. And, and um, I'm gonna take a different tack. I'm gonna talk about harmony in this particular case, in this particular case where harmony is heaviness and shadows. And that's what makes for the 55 Wall Street and 60 Wall Street seem to coalesce into a harmonious relationship. And if, if, the, if the, the colonnade, even the way it's made Egyptian style and heaviness at the bottom is really quite powerful in terms of the heaviness of it. And, and in this case, obviously it's modern and it's light. And of course, the proportions, the space between the columns give harmony, of course. But this idea of heaviness and shadow should be maintained. And I think they can indeed have more light entering the building by just making the facade, the, the building itself, uh, more um, uh, transparent. And they can do that simply enough. And I think the way they bring the light into the interior and they can bring it somewhat to the exteriors, it's a nice architectural device. They have some beautiful architectural devices that they're using in this building. But I think the heaviness and the proportion, that has to be maintained. Okay, thank you very much, Commissioner Gustafson. Wow, what did, what did we do back in 1984? Um, from what I've heard today, 
um, we approved a non-interactive building that's a fortress. It's passive, it's outdated, um, it obstructs views, it's uncompetitive, it's not inviting, it's not commercially viable, it's inaccessible, it doesn't allow for light and air, it does a non-welcoming nature, it is unsafe, it is a bad neighbor, um, and it is, uh, uh, I guess, simply bad from a programmatic and operational standpoint. Um, that's a lot of bad stuff. Um, and I think that um, thou doth protest too much. Um, I agree with Commissioner Jefferson that there is a way um, to, short of the dramatic change proposed, uh, which to me is more fitting um, if you had dropped this into uh, the Madison Avenue, Park Avenue, Midtown area, I would have said harmonious. Um, uh, and here, I don't think it is, but I do think they have lots of options. I don't think they have to um, um, undo this entirely in order to achieve their goals. I think someone emphasized how what they're doing on the interior um, really is very, very effective in terms of addressing that litany of um, issues that I had um, given you earlier. Um, so I, I don't believe that this current design is um, uh, creates that harmonious relationship. Uh, but I do believe, as many of the other commissioners have suggested, that there are lots of ways to get there, um, and that and that at some moment they will be coming back to us and we'll be saying yes. Okay, thank you, thank you, all commissioners, for your really thoughtful um, comments and conversation here. And I think that we have given the applicants uh, a, a good to set of direction or good direction. Um, I think we've had very comments, but I, there are some common themes. Um, one is that the, um, as proposed, the existing base uh, does not relate to have a harmonious relationship at this point. It's not found to have a harmonious relationship with 55 by virtue of its uh, proportions and rhythm and scale. Um, and in addition, we've also heard that the fact that the building is sort of turned into two parts that is not sort of comp comprehensive or consistent within its entirety makes it disharmonious with a building that is actually consistent from top to bottom. And so the integrity of the building as a whole is important to, and thinking about the building as a whole in that uh, harmonious relationship is important to thinking about how harmonious it is. And so we've heard um, some comments that the, um, the base could be reworked to relate better to 55 and to the building above. Um, and we've also heard some suggestions that the base could just be more modestly reworked to achieve some of the goals to, uh, at the interior. Uh, for example, you know, reconfiguring the wall and the glazing behind the columns. So I think we will leave it with that for today. We'll take no action. We'll ask the applicants to think about the comments that we've given and um, we would be happy to have you back um, when you're ready to present a revised proposal to us. So um, with that, I would, um, the hearing is closed, so I would say thank you all and thank you to the applicants for your thoughtful presentation and we're happy to see you when you're um, ready to present a revised proposal to us. And we'll move to the next item. Okay, the next item is public hearing item number two, LPC 22-09590 an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan Block 610, Lot 9, 225 West 4th Street in the Greenwich Village Historic District. This is a utilitarian brick building built in the 1920s and two row houses built in 1873. And the application is to reconstruct an, an enclosed sidewalk cafe, uh, modify openings, and install storefront infill. Hey, Commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Uh, Jackie, you now have control of the presentation. Just click on your screen and then you can advance the slides. Please state your name for the record and you may begin. Thank you so much, Abby. Um, hello everyone, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, just nod. Okay. Yes, yeah. we can hear you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hello commissioners and landmark staff, 
Thank you for uh, hearing our application today. My name is Jackie Prudy Vallon. I'm the preservation consultant on this project. I'm here today with the architect, Matthew Griswinski of, Gris of Griswinski Ponds Architects and Tim Sykes of Ruby's Cafe. <clears throat> Excuse me. The project we're showing you today is 225 West 4th Street, the location of a new Ruby's Cafe. The proposal is to replace the existing enclosed sidewalk cafe, install new window open, a new window opening, uh, install new windows within existing masonry openings, repaint the facade and install painted signage and to install rooftop HVAC equipment. The project location is at the convergence of 7th Avenue South, West 4th Street and West 10th Street. These three buildings are combined into one tax lot on this triangle of land that was formed when, when 7th Avenue South was cut through. The restaurant space occupies the one-story triangular building at the south end of the lot and the basement floors of the two adjacent houses. So I'm highlighting that here. <clears throat> you can see from 7th Avenue South what this looks like. You've got the one-story building and this um, somewhat below grade portion of these two houses here. So, and here on West 4th Street, this is the one-story building and um, the below grade portion, <clears throat> the basement level of these houses. Excuse me. Here are existing condition photos, again, of 7th Avenue South. The existing glass sidewalk cafe enclosure has been covered in plywood just for security. So that's why it looks a bit obscured. Um, you'll notice what, this is what I'm calling the prow of the building. Uh, there is an existing doorway here. And we are part of this proposal is to replace that doorway with a faux door, um, simply because for the design of the interior of this restaurant, they want to change the circulation. So um, I'll be pointing out this location, the end of the prow again later in the presentation. Here are existing condition photos of West 4th Street or the West Elevation. There's an existing exposed steel lintel that has been parched over and scored cement stucco um, in this brown painted portion of the, of the facade. Here are views of the roof uh, of the one-story building looking north and looking south. That's the existing dunnage. There had been very large mechanical, mechanical equipment installed on top of it for the previous restaurant. <clears throat> Excuse me. And now coming around to the north end of the lot, we're hiding, highlighting where the restaurant space is at the basement level of the two houses. So here you can see this at the Chamford corner. This is uh, going along West 10th Street. This, uh, this window is proposed for replacement. And this is the portion of West on the West 4th Street elevation. Okay, um, just to briefly show you some history on this building. On the left is the building in 1930. You'll notice that at that time, there was a large plate glass window highlighting here on the West 4th Street elevation under the steel lintel that is still visible. You can kind of see it in this photo. The center photo is from 1933. And in the photo on the right from 1939, there was a diner called Rikers that had light and, and it had a light painted facade with lots of painted wall signs and sloped awnings on the 7th Avenue South elevation. And some more historic images. Here on the left is the building in the 1940s. You can see the uh, large glazed openings on both elevations more clearly in this photo. And on the right is the designation photo, which unfortunately is very dark and we can't see much. <clears throat> me. Uh, here's the building in happier times and when it was still the Riviera Cafe. And this, these are Google, just Google Street View images from 2014. I just wanted to give you a sense of what this looked like when it was still you know, an active in use building. Um, you can see more clearly the sidewalk cafe enclosure that we're seeking to replace and the large HVAC equipment, which had been on the roof. Now, just to briefly um, explain the block development, this unique triangular lot um, where these buildings stands is, is a consequence of 7th Avenue South being laid down in the early 20th century. On the left is the 1862 map showing a wood frame structure that was previously on these lots. At the center uh, map from 1899, you can see masonry houses there. And on the right, the lot as, a, as, as it appeared in 1930. 
Here's the existing floor plan, uh, which shows how the one story building relates to the adjacent basement spaces. Note the steps that bring you down into the basements uh, of the adjoining houses from the um, from the at grade restaurant um, area. You can also see the existing large openings in the masonry facade beside, be, I'm sorry, behind the existing enclosed sidewalk cafe. So here you can see where portions of walls have just been pretty much completely removed and where that uh, previous large uh, glazed opening was, was enclosed. So this is now masonry here as well. And this is the proposed plan. Uh, you can see the new windows installed within the existing masonry openings on the 7th Avenue South elevation. That's coming along here. And the new window opening that's proposed for the West 4th Street elevation, showing that here. Now I'm just going to take you through um, elevation drawings. So here's the existing 7th Avenue South elevation. I'm going to, can I zoom in on this? No, I can't zoom in. Um, basically, I'm sorry that these notes are so small, but what we're showing you is there's painted brick here. This is um, just a glass and aluminum assembly for the enclosed sidewalk cafe. Um, there is, uh, there's these brick columns, which actually have steel angles on the outside. Um, and those are also remaining untouched. Uh, and here's uh, where there's existing masonry that's kind of been parched over over the years at the prow of the building. Here's the one window uh, that we're proposing to change. And also over here, this below grade entrance into the, into the, the house that's on West 10th Street, where we're also proposing changes. So here we're showing you the proposed sidewalk cafe, which would now be built of um, a poured concrete base with timber, timber above, single hung uh, windows with you know, um, you know, single panes of glass, uh, standing seam metal roof, painting the existing masonry uh, a, a sort of uh, warm bone color or biscuit color, installing a small uh, painted uh, sign here, showing Little Ruby's Cafe in red, and the new mechanical equipment. Over here, we're proposing a um, fixed multi-light uh, window. And down here at this uh, below grade entrance, proposing to replace the, the door and side light and to install another fixed multi-light window next to it. So I just wanted to zoom in. Okay, we can read the notes a little better on my zoom in. Um, so here what I was trying to uh, convey to you before, stud frame wall assembly with various exterior finishes. Uh, this is a building that was just kind of parged over and painted over many times um, in the last, I'd say 60 years. Um, painted steel angles bracing around these columns. And again, uh, the proposed uh, enclosure showing cast in place concrete wall base, timber here on the sides, the single hung um, large pane of glass windows with the um, standing seam metal roof, trying to keep it very light and airy and um, somewhat ephemeral looking because it's a sidewalk, uh, enclosed sidewalk cafe. Here are um, elevations to compare the existing side of the sidewalk cafe to the proposed. And this is the existing elevation. If the existing enclosure was removed, so you could see these very large um, gaping masonry openings that are, that are still in place. And this is what the uh, alteration would look like without you know, we're just cutting a section through um, the sidewalk cafe enclosure. So you can see the rhythm of the multi-light windows being proposed, the new door being proposed. And now um, we're going to the Chamford corner where 7th Avenue meets uh, West 10th Street. There's an existing large plate glass window at that, at that below, below grade entrance. We're pro proposing to infill that with brick that would be toothed in um, and then painted as well because the rest of the base of the, the building is painted. Uh, replacing the existing door and side light as well. And now going on to West 4th Street, um, existing conditions are again, painted brick wall. There's a, a picture window that we were proposing to remove, louvered openings that we're proposing to remove. Um, this 
this brown painted uh, concrete that was in, you know, infilled where the previous picture window had been. And the proposed elevation for West 4th Street um, with this nice rhythm of multi light windows continuing from the 7th Avenue elevation. These windows, incidentally, would be double hung and operable. Um, <clears throat> the Little Ruby's um, Cafe sign that we're proposing. The um, proposed Dunnage, uh, sorry, the um, HVAC equipment on the existing Dunnage at the roof. And now looking at the prow of the building. So um, there has historically been a door at this prow. Um, what we're proposing to do is keep the presence of a door, but make it a false door so that um, they can have the circulation within the restaurant, serve their needs, and um, still maintain what would look like a, a, you know, a historic door location from the outside of the building. And now going up to West 10th Street elevation again, uh, this is the location of the window that's getting replaced. And here it is, it's just a fixed, fixed pane, um, again, looking like multi-light windows, like the rest of the windows that they want to do at this, at this um, floor. And now looking at the roof, so here's the existing roof plan and the photo again, looking south, down 7th Avenue South to show you the existing roof. Here's the locations of the proposed mechanical equipment. The equipment itself uh, would be approximately almost 11 feet long in total and approximately bet varying between six to eight feet tall, uh, including the dunnage it would sit on top of. Here's a sight line drawing showing um, standing across West 4th Street. And now just to give you some streetscape photos so that um, helps you um, consider this in context. So we're looking southwest on 7th Avenue South in this photo on the left. On the right, looking southeast down 7th Avenue South from West 10th Street. Oops, sorry, I advanced by accident. Um, some more streetscape context photos. Um, this is looking south below our project location and this, this top left photo, top right photo, you can see our project location here. So we're looking from near Charles Street. Um, on the bottom left, it, you see what the corner looks like uh, adjacent to our project between Christopher and, and West 4th Street. And then on the bottom right, Northwest corner, 7th Avenue South and West 10th Street. Here are some existing sidewalk cafes within the district. Um, you'll note they mostly have just large plate glass windows. Here's one that has multi-light windows with natural finish um, on the wood. Um, there are stand, there's a couple of examples of standing seam metal roofs, otherwise canvas roofs. And now just to show you some renderings of what the, the project would look like. Here's a rendering showing you what the what the south building, the, the one-story building would look like if the enclosed sidewalk cafe were not there. And here's our finish uh, finishes palette. So again, the color proposed for everything really is a, a biscuit or a soft kind of bone color. And the finish on the windows, the double hung multi-light windows would be a clear finish, um, sort of uh, white oak. And that's it. We're open to any questions or comments you have. Thank you. Thank you. All right, commissioners, do we have any questions? Yeah. I don't think we have any questions right yeah, now. So we will move to public testimony. If you're in the meeting. Oh, Commissioner Jefferson, did you have a question? Sorry. Commissioner Jefferson, did you have a question? Just accept the request to unmute. Yes. Um, it's a nicely done project. The issue for me is the mechanical units on the roof. And in several drawings, you see them low and you see them high. And you mm -hmm. finally said they were about eight feet high. Are mm -hmm. they going to be painted white? Are they going to be gray? What color would um, they be? And how do they? How do you see them from across the street if they're? Uh, because this is this is a form. So I'm wondering how you mm -hmm. treat mechanical units. 
Um, you know, maybe it was a mistake on our part to not build a mock-up and take pictures of an actual mock-up. We just took it for granted that they're going to be so, so unavoidably visible that we didn't do that. Um, but we can, they can be painted. Absolutely. They can be painted any color commissioners want. Um, but really in this case, there's just nowhere else for the restaurant to put their mechanicals because they don't have, um, they don't have a lease to the, the roof on top of the houses behind. Um, and that would be too far anyway. There's no, you know, there's just no other space for them. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Commissioner Latvi, please go ahead. Um, I just have a question about the base of your building on the West Fourth Street elevation. It looks like it's brick. And, yes. uh, and on the Seventh Avenue South, it is what it's concrete. And if is that is that what it is? Or it looks different. And I was just wondering why. Yes. So you mean in these two renderings you're seeing on the yeah. screen now. Uh -huh. Right. Uh -huh. So you're right. There's going to be some infill brick necessary um, on the West 4th Street elevation because where I'm highlighting right now, that's currently just a huge expanse of, of concrete, you know, um, parging that was done at some point. So there will be some infill brick. The rest of the facade is brick. On the 7th Avenue South elevation, where you're seeing here the, the sidewalk cafe enclosure, that will be, um, that will not be brick. That's a separate, because um, it's a separate structure. And they want to do it in concrete at the base, uh, simply for waterproofing. Um, you know, if and because they think concrete also would be able to have a, a warmer texture to it than say something else you typically see like metal um, for these sidewalk cafe enclosures. Um, they can't continue wood down to the sidewalk because that would, um, you know, that would just suck up water and become deteriorated very quickly. So you are seeing concrete at the base of. The, the portion that would be the enclosed sidewalk cafe, whereas the rest of the facade of the main building is brick. And but would brick be a problem at the base? Um, I think that's for all of you to decide. Um, I would think that brick um, would, I would think brick would be uh, read as, as uh, looking too much like the main building, whereas mm -hmm. with these sidewalk cafes, you usually want to keep them looking separate from the main building and looking lighter and more, uh, more temporary. Um, so the thinking is that the concrete at the bottom of the, of the sidewalk cafe enclosure would look like stucco, but just be a little more substantial than stucco and just would stand up to water better over the years. Okay. That, so that's, that's the logic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? All right, so I think now we'll move to public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Sonia Gior to take us through the testimony. Thank you. Our first speaker will be Helen Freeman. And Helen, you should be able to unmute your line. If you could please state your name for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Hi, uh, I'm Helen Freeman from Historic Districts Council. HCC asks that the neighborhood map currently on the West 10th Street facade be maintained. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker will be Christina Conroy. Christina, I'll be promoting you to panelist. And you should be able to unmute your line. If you could please state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Okay, uh, good afternoon, commissioners. I'm Christina Conroy for the Victorian Society, New York. The Victorian Society generally supports this proposal for alterations at this prominent mixed use corner of the village. Both the 1920s buildings and the basement levels of the earlier row houses have undergone many similar changes over the years. Those proposed here do not appear to affect historic fabric and seem compatible in design with the buildings and the surrounding context. We recommend, however, that the awkward square column covers at the prow of the 1920s building be removed to reveal the original round columns underneath seen in tax photo on board seven. Thank you. Thank you. We do not have any other signups and there are no other hands raised and no submitted testimony. 
So I'll note that Manhattan Community Board 2 recommends approval of the off-white color for the building and the two painted signs, recommends approval of the windows on the 7th Avenue side and the window and door on the 10th Street side. And they also recommend the following, that the window on the 4th Street side be under the exposed beam matching the existing window placement and that a second separate window continue northward of this window. And that the legality of the construction of an outdoor cafe at this location be unambiguously established by the applicant. And if it is found to be permitted, that the proposed design be approved. Okay, thank back. you. Thank you very much. All right, so I'd like to turn it back to you, Jackie, to see if you'd like mm -hmm. to respond to any of the comments that we've heard. Right. Um, regarding the map, I think uh, it is a charming map on the West 10th Street elevation. Um, I don't think that's necessarily a decision for this tenant, the restaurant going in, but um, I, I believe the landlord is watching this. So I'm, I'm sure they're hearing the, the community concerns about that. Um, I don't see a reason why I couldn't stay, but it, again, it's, um, I don't think it's the tenant's decision. Uh, regarding the columns, um, that was considered in a way, it's um, just the condition of the columns themselves and, you know, at some point, bracing was put around the brick columns. So the condition of them is, is um, unknown and it's, un it's unknown to me if they could um, you know, do that with the, with the landlord's permission, put in, put in the, uh, the rounded columns again, but it's, it's definitely something that they can, they can discuss with the landlord. Um, regarding the window openings that, with, that uh, the community board uh, brought up, uh, for West 4th Street. Yes, I hear what they're saying about having the window opening aligned with um, the extent of the, the exposed steel beam, um, but uh, it's, it would be difficult for them to have two, split that up into two separate openings then just because of what's happening uh, on the other side of the, the blank portion of wall uh, in the proposed floor plan. Floor plan. So um, in this design, they, they feel it's just more coherent and more of a, of a, of a uh, holistic treatment of the building to have this continuous row of multi-light double hung windows to mirror what's happening on the 7th Avenue elevation. Okay, is that it? Um, I do see a hand raised, Sonia. So I just wonder if that's somebody who wants to speak on this item. Let's see. Okay, Tim Sykes, I'll be promoting you to panelist. And you should be able to unmute your line if you'd like to um, state your name for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Hi there, my name's Tim Sykes. Um, I'm one of the partners uh, working on the project on the tenant side. Uh, thank you all for your time. I appreciate all the comments and feedback. The only comment I was gonna make is that we would be open to brick. Uh, at the base of the outdoor enclosure, if, if that's preferred, um, that, that wouldn't be a problem from our side, that's all. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, commissioners, do we have any final questions? Okay, I'm sending you requests to unmute. So if you can, whoops, go ahead and accept those, that would be great. And uh, we'll go ahead and close the hearing and begin our discussion. So Commissioner Jefferson, would you make a motion to close the hearing? No motion. Thank you. And Commissioner Devonshire, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And we all, I think, are pretty familiar with the character of 7th Avenue South, um, which is a, a very mixed character as well as it has a very commercial nature. Um, and as it was, as described by the applicant, laid uh, later in intersecting the previous street grid, there are a number of unusually shaped triangular lots that resulted from that. And many of those contained taxpayers, which the commission has historically allowed a lot of change to, including demolishing and replacing with new buildings, or um, a lot of, uh, or the commission has allowed a great flexibility in uh, readapting those, including um, flexibility in color and openings and um, 
and uh, windows and signage. So with that, we will look at this, but we'll look at it in the context of 7th Avenue South and then you know, in the larger historic district, but knowing that we have had um, a lot of flexibility on 7th Avenue South or allowed a lot of flexibility on 7th Avenue South, I think that just starting off that the conceptually this proposal sort of fits within those, our past actions here and our past regulatory approach for 7th Avenue South, but I know we may have comments on specific aspects of it. So we'll go ahead and start that discussion now. Uh, oh, and just also with respect to enclosed sidewalk cafes, um, where they existed prior to designation, we have allowed reconstructing them or uh, changing them, adapting them. Um, if the new form is more sort of transparent, lightweight or temporary in nature. And I, that is why I think the applicant was in their presentation of the enclosure trying to describe it as a discrete, more uh, kind of lightweight temporary uh, reading structure. Okay, so we'll begin the discussion. Commissioner Lutfi, would you like to start this one? Sure. Um, first of all, it's so wonderful that this, uh, this site is going to be uh, reactivated and um, it looks from this application like it could really add um, in a very positive way to the landscape of uh, this district. I think this is a great project. Um, I really appreciate the fact that it uh, uh, visually is hearkening back uh, a little bit to uh, what was here in the late 1930s, both in, uh, in terms of, especially in terms of the color. And um, the thing about 7th Avenue South in general is I think it could use a lift. So I am very much in favor of the white. Um, I think the glazing works very well. Um, and uh, the awning uh, fits in. I don't think it has to look like an addition. I think that's why, uh, that's why I think I uh, thought the, uh, the brick might work on the, the 7th Avenue South side because then it makes it a very cohesive, uh, visually a cohesive looking uh, uh, statement. Uh, so I, you know, I can approve this. Thank you, Commissioner Jefferson. Uh, yeah, they it, it they did a wonderful job on this. It's really quite quite harmonious, if you will. It works very well. The plan is um, the, the plan is geometric and and it's open in elevation and section. And, the only comment I have is I wish they had put up a screen of some sort for the mechanical equipment, because this is such a beautiful and formal project, but I can understand the constraints. I, I, I can approve this. Okay, thank you. Oh, one, one other issue, I think yes. the, the base should be, be reevaluated with the help of the staff. Okay, all right. And are you open to a brick material as Commissioner Lutfi suggested? Absolutely, whatever the staff thinks is appropriate. Okay. Commissioner Gustafson. Uh, well, I, frankly, uh, Chair Carroll, you said everything that I wanted to say, which is to say, uh, you know, appropriateness in, in an historic district can be defined a number of ways, but um, uh, when, you, when you see exactly what someone would expect to see in the particular place, in this case, a triangular corner in the West Village, um, there's really not much more to comment on. Um, I wouldn't glance twice, so it can't possibly detract from the character or the context. I, I, you can tweak a few things here and there on the base, et cetera, uh, but I, don't, I would accept it just as it is. I even accept the visibility of the, um, um, the rooftop accretions and, that, and that's largely because that's exactly what you see on all of these uh, tr triangular buildings in, uh, in the village. So, uh, so I'm okay with it all. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, I agree. I think it's entirely appropriate as they've presented it. And um, if others feel that the base should be changed to brick, I'm in support of that too. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chapin. 
Uh, yeah, I uh, I agree with the other commissioners, and um, I think that yeah, the the brick base would be a little uh, nicer. And but in general, it's a great project, and uh, I can approve it. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Goldblum. Oh, I think he stepped away, Commissioner Devin. Yeah, he stepped away. Yeah. Nicely done. Um, I can approve it as is. If they want to put brick on the base, it might enhance it a bit, but I can approve it as it is. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I mean the agreement with the colleagues. Um, but if if some if somebody wants uh, the uh, to work with the staff uh, on some of the items, I have no problem with it. Okay, so I think. Um, we have just shy of six of us that are okay with it as is, but um, I think first I wanna say, I think everybody is very welcoming of this design and finds it conceptually to be very appropriate. Um, but we have had a couple of comments that you asking that the applicant continue to work with the staff on the material for the base. So we will um, ask them to do that. And um, Commissioner Lutfi, would you make that motion? Sure. Uh, in the matter of LPC-22-09590 to 25 West 4th Street, Greenwich Village Historic District, a, util a utilitarian brick building built in the 1920s and two row houses built in 1873. The application is to reconstruct an enclosed sidewalk cafe, modify openings, and install storefront in Bell. I know that the building style scale materials and details are among the features which contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Greenwich Village Historic District. I recommend approval finding that the proposed work will not damage or destroy any significant architectural features that the removal of brick, concrete block and stucco infill at historic masonry openings will return the building closer to its historic appearance. That historic photograph show the building being painted a light color in the 1940s and document a variety of uses and commercial tenant signage and branding and the proposed off-white painted finish with painted signage is consistent with historic changes to this building and other garage buildings within the district as they were adapted for new uses over time. That the proposed multi-light window and door assemblies and existing and modified openings and off-white paint at the street and lower commercial levels at the brick facades of adjacent buildings will harmonize with the new fenestration details and finish at the one-story building, thereby presenting unified storefront across the facades. That the proposed design for the cafe enclosure including large operable windows and a standing seam metal roof will maintain a sense of transparency to the original brick facade and will differentiate the cafe as a secondary accretion in the original big brick building that the proposed false door at the prow of the one-story building will return this feature closer to its historic appearance and that the Proposed work will not detract from, uh, from the historic and architectural character of the building or the Greenwich Village Historic District. I recommend that the applicant uh, work with staff uh, on the base of the enclosure and uh, in terms of its materiality. Okay. Thank you. And Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? A second. Thank you. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum's not here. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. With eight in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. Thank you, commissioners. Great. Thank you. And please continue to work with the staff. 
Thank okay. You. So we are going to break for lunch now. We are about a half an hour, well, about 35 minutes behind schedule. We do have a long afternoon session with another 10 items. So I'm gonna ask that we take a 25 minute lunch today and return promptly at 1.30 so we can kick off the afternoon session. And um, we'll ask all members of the public to voluntarily leave the meeting at this time so that you can easily return at 1.30 and we'll see everyone else at 1.30. Thank you.